order from May 18th, 2021. Clerk. Thank you, Your Honor. 11 are present and voting. All right, we, will, we have a quorum and we will proceed. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, flag, the flag of, of the United States of America, to the republic, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now we'll be led uh, in our invocation uh, by Alder Brunette, but I believe Alder Brunette has a guest for us this evening. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to introduce Maximus KB, who will be leading our invocation. He is the Child and Youth Faith Formation Director and Ecumenical Officer for the Diocese of Green Bay. He and his wife live in the area. Thank you, Maximus. Thank you, it is a pleasure to be with you all. And um, today I'm, I'm sharing an adaptation of an invocation delivered by Archbishop Charles Chaput at a Philadelphia City Council meeting in 2011. So it's adapted for all of us here today. So with that, so leadership requires two virtues that seem very simple until they'll become very inconvenient. Honesty and courage are the two virtues that it requires. All of you have been honored with the trust of the people of Green Bay. But along with that honor and trust comes a duty of humility, integrity, and public service. For this, we need the help and guidance of our Creator. And so we quiet ourselves and petition. God of justice and mercy, thank you for the gift of life and the opportunity to serve the people of our city. Help us to act with character and conviction. Help us to listen with understanding and goodwill. Help us to speak with charity and restraint. Give us a spirit of service. Remind us that we are stewards of your authority. Guide us to be the leaders your people need. Help us see the humanity and dignity of those who disagree with us and to treat all persons, no matter how weak or poor, with the reverence your creation deserves. And finally, Father, renew us with the strength of your presence and the joy of helping to build a community worthy of the human person. We ask this as your daughters and sons, confident in your goodness and love. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much for those wise words, sir. Appreciate you joining us this evening. It's good to be here. Thank you. On to approval of the minutes. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Motion to approve made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Stevens. Any uh, corrections there? Seeing no requests, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. All these are approved. Approval of the agenda. Motion to approve. <clears throat> Second. Second. Motion to approve made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Corpus Dax. Any changes? Seeing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The agenda has been approved. Report by the mayor. Um, just a couple items tonight. Um, the first one sort of housekeeping related. Uh, I think uh, all of our council is aware that we're going to be transitioning to a hybrid form of uh, meeting for our next meeting, the first meeting in June. So just wanted to remind everyone, uh, invite uh, those council members who are comfortable to, to come back to our council chambers. Uh, we will be able to accommodate that. Um, also, you know, inviting the public if, if that's the, the most comfortable way for them to attend our meetings, but uh, also reminding folks that we, we will still have this virtual option, both for the public and for our council members for the foreseeable future. Um, so, you know, we might miss out a little bit on the, on the pre-meeting banter on the, on the part of our council, but I think many of us are, are looking forward to, to getting back in person. Um, we just wanted to remind everyone of, of that change. And then in terms of the agenda this evening, just wanted to note, um, you know, the, the really exciting 
development agreement that we have in front of us with Merge Urban Development. Um, just very appreciative of the, their interest, their investment in the city. It's a site that I think has been in the city's hands for around 30 years, um, acquired, I believe, from Fort Howard several decades ago and, uh, and has been undeveloped for a significant period of time. Um, so really excited to have this first development in the shipyard, um, one that I'm very confident will spur future development. Um, and when you compare it to some of the, uh, the concepts that have been um, proposed previously, you know, I think it measures up really, really well. Um, it has a higher valuation uh, than both of the, the previous uh, concepts that have been brought forward to our common council. Um, there's also a planning option um, that is, um, is not on our agenda this evening, but was uh, approved by our RDA with impact seven, um, which if that were to move forward uh, would also be a very exciting development. So there's a lot of momentum, uh, I think, you know, all across our community, a lot of uh, pent up energy. And, uh, and this, this development agreement, I think is an indication of um, some more good news to come. So of course, uh, again, thanking uh, Merge Urban Development for all of their work, all of our staff uh, at community and economic development, but also our city attorney and our finance director um, for all of their work in, in pulling this agreement together. Um, these things are never Never easy, oftentimes complicated, and and you know certainly that was the case here. But there's been tremendous cooperation from both city staff and from our developers. So urging your support for that agreement, um, and uh, and also and finally, you know, wanted to thank Alder Johnson for his leadership um, throughout this process. Has been a strong advocate, of course, for his district and for the shipyard, um, and that certainly has been the case uh, with this agreement. Um, so, the so new announcements. I have one. Yes, Alder Dorf. So this is um, an announcement in which I'm going to be thanking a large group of people. Back in the 1960s, National Public Works Week was created. And it happens that May 16th through the 22nd is National Public Works Week this year. And the theme this year is Stronger Together. And it talks about how the community, the citizens working with our public works people, employees, department, Together, we can make a better community. So as we know, public works helps maintain our community strength by working on our infrastructure um, with roads and transportation and water. It's actually bigger than just DPW, but I particularly would like to call out DPW and say thank you. Thank you, employees of the Department of Public Works, also water employees if you are out there and transportation employees. Um, this is your week to be recognized, and I just want you to know that we really appreciate you thank you very well said alder dorf and uh, just to let everyone know i believe on thursday night or yeah thursday night on may 20th the bridge will be lit in honor of our, our public works employees uh so it'll be lit orange to recognize all that all that great work in that service so thank you alder thanks other announcements mayor yes alder johnson Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a couple of quick ones. First, this weekend is the New Leaf Garden Blitz. For those not familiar, uh, this is an activity where 85 raised bed gardens throughout the community will be constructed with the assistance of volunteers. All the beds have been sold. Um, however, they are still in need of volunteers. So if anybody is interested with that, delivering soil, constructing garden beds, things of that nature, uh, please reach out to that organization, New Leaf uh, Garden Blitz, and they're doing some wonderful things in our community to help um, mentor and, and uh, sustain, create sustainable urban farming uh, methods. The second is I want to give a quick shout out to someone who probably doesn't get a lot of accolades because he really kind of hides in the back, uh, but our IT director, Mike Karanik. Uh, I've been working with him for a while, uh, as well as our, our police department uh, and our parks department on installing some security cameras over at Seymour Park to address some concerns that we've had over there. And um, Mike and I communicated this week and literally guys within like two days, he had security cameras in the park. So um, I just don't think there's a lot of opportunity for him to get those public accolades. He deserves it. He does a lot of great work for the city. So thank you. Uh, thank you to all the partners there that helped make that happen. And the last thing I just wanna mention, 
For those who have ever been to my office, you know I have a fishbowl, and it is incredibly embarrassing when people walk down this hallway and see you with your hand over your heart in an office by yourself saying the Pledge of Allegiance, but I owned it and I got some good laughs in the hallway, so uh, it was fun. <laughs> nice, very well said. Uh, other announcements? All right, seeing none, we will move along to appointments. Motion to approve. Second. All right, motion to approve the new appointments is made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Stevens. Any discussion? Mayor, I need to be recorded as an abstention on Kasha Hintowski. She's a member of my executive committee that oversees my compensation. Very good, that will be noted. Any others? All right, all in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. If you guys have it, and those appointments are confirmed. Uh, and now uh, we have a presentation in front of us. So I'll just make a few introductory remarks and then turn it over to the folks from the Community Housing Initiative who have joined us this evening. Um, Alder Vanderleest, could you mute, mute yourself possibly? Yes. Very good. Thank you, Alder. Um, so we do have a presentation here in front of us from, like I said, the Community Housing Initiative. Um, for those of you who, who don't recall, um, this, uh, this group really was formed um, because of the work of Dennis Bueller the, from the Greater Green Bay Community Foundation, um, but in collaboration also with Robin Davis at the United Way and her entire team, uh, Brown County and the City of Green Bay. Um, they've been hard at work over the past several months, um, putting together a strategic plan to really eliminate chronic homelessness in, uh, in Greater Green Bay. Um, and we are really nearing the end of that process. I believe by the end of the summer, um, we should have a plan in front of us, in front of the public um, to take a look at and, and take in and, and hopefully to, to begin implementation. Um, and uh, last month we had a discussion about some programming at St. John's Park. Uh, uh, clear that um, that I think the council could benefit from um, from having a little bit of an update from our um, community housing initiative and our partners there, and so I welcomed them in. They were gracious enough to uh, to attend our meeting tonight and uh, and are going to be able to to give a little bit of an update again on the on the progress of that plan and what we can look forward to seeing in the months to come. Um, so with that, I will turn things over, I believe, to Dennis Bueller. Uh, who is joining us, as I said, from the Greater Green Bay Community Foundation. Dennis. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you to the Council for inviting uh, myself and my colleagues in uh, tonight. Um, to just allow me a moment to level set, as the Mayor uh, referenced, kind of our effort and what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, many of you know uh, the Green Bay Community Foundation, the Brown County United Way, because of our philanthropic work um, all across this community. Um, but when we think beyond the grant, um, we also play a central role as partners to convene and listen and advocate for priorities identified. And while our grant making really serves as a critical role in filling immediate needs many times, I think it really is our joint commitment to systemic issues and collective impact that can sustain change all across our community long term. I know many of you have seen this in action across educational efforts, health, other systems, particularly those in human services. But as the mayor referenced, uh, what brings us here today really is a clear understanding that episodes of homelessness in our community, whether those are seen, or it is also should be noted those that are unseen, um, are having a dramatic impact in the lives of those in our community. Um, but this is something we really can solve together. Um, there are nonprofits, there's organizations, leaders, others. I know many, there are a number of people on this call listening today um, who are working hard every single day uh, to support those who are affected by homelessness or the root causes that really have led to that petition. We also know that across the spectrum of care and support, um, these efforts can be as well intentioned and as impactful as they are. At times, they can be somewhat. Um, in ways that may have a short-term result, but really are not making the cycle in a way that I know we would all like to be able to see. So we find ourselves 
like many, many communities, we're not unique this way, at a time where we really must and can act together with resource and leadership and intent to act and learn from others, to create pathways so those who are struggling each day can better support um, themselves and those in the front lines of this particular issue. And really, that is the spirit that brought the foundation, the United Way, Brown County Executive Streckenbach, Mayor Gengrich, um, the Brown County Homeless and Housing Coalition, I know today represented by uh, Noel Halverson, um, and many together to really begin thinking about a blueprint for success. But before I kind of get to how we see that facilitated effort um, has been or will work, I would like uh, to introduce my partner and, and colleague, um, Robin Davis, uh, to speak a little bit from her professional experience and history with this issue, as well as why you know coming together now is so important for our overall success. So Robin, maybe you could build on that a bit? Sure, thank you, Dennis, and good evening, Mayor Henrik, and council members. Um, really thank you for the opportunity to come this evening and address you. and. Um, some of you may know that before I joined uh, Brown County United Way as the president and CEO, I spent eight years as the president of Freedom House, um, which is a uh, homeless shelter that serves, walks alongside of um, homeless families with children in their journey from homelessness to stability. And um, over the years uh, between the coalition and community stakeholders and other um, passionate and empathetic um, community members, there were many attempts to come together uh, in order to eradicate homelessness. And the most recent attempt that I um, had the opportunity to be a part of was in 2013 and 2014. And um, we accomplished a, a lot to raise awareness and um, an understanding of the issue. But one of the areas that we looked at very closely was a community-wide plan to eradicate homelessness. And we took a look at plans from across the country um, and really felt then, as I do today, that we have an opportunity in our community to get our arms around this issue and really make a difference. Um, and, and change the lives of not only those who are experiencing homelessness, but our community as a whole. Um, at the, however, we felt that um, we had gone, the group that was assembled as far as we could go in terms of bringing more um, necessary partners to the table. And so at that time, um, we went to uh, the United Way, we went to the Community Foundation and the Chamber to talk about the work that we had done. And that was, as I said before, I was at United Way, it, it predated um, Dennis's uh, tenure at the Community Foundation. And at that moment, there were some decisions that were made to go in a different direction, all good because powerful work has been done, but we circle around and we find ourselves here at this moment. And when Dennis approached me um, in 2019 and said, here's what we're thinking, are you in? Uh, both hands went up because the issue was personal to me because of my experience as a provider and also because we had buy-in um, from the city of Green Bay as well as Brown County. And when you look at the plans, it just took me back to five, however many years ago it had been, that government, philanthropy, nonprofits, um, providers, lived experience, all those voices were um, absolutely critical to moving our community forward. And the opportunity to be a part of this initiative because of um, the number of stakeholders that are at the table and the broad base of um, interests and sectors that are represented um, really, in my opinion, make this um, the time. Right, we talked about it a lot, but this is the time. And as with a lot of uh, community challenges and opportunities, Green Bay has the opportunity to continue to be, um, I don't wanna, maybe I'll use cutting edge, but really to set the example, right? For the Midwest and our size community. And so I'm really excited at the progress that we've made, as well as um, where we're going uh, in the days and the months ahead, and really um, excited about this opportunity, as I said before, to share with you um, where we've been and where we're going. Thank you. And, and I thank think- you, Rob. Thank you, Robin. Oh, I'm sorry, Robin. 
I was going to say thank you for those uh, comments. And um, I think we're all very excited that we have a coalition across the community of, of leaders at the table ready to act. But I think we all also recognize we have so much work yet to do. Um, and it's going to really take all of us to accomplish this particular goal. But as Robin said, I think we're at a moment in time where we really believe that we can tackle this as a community, as nonprofits, as philanthropies, as policy leaders, all working really in the same direction. Um, but each one of us plays a critical role and every role is important, but we really need to understand what those roles are. And there's a lot to learn from across the country and understand its application to our particular community. And that's something our task force talked about. And we understood it was gonna require some facilitation to bring these diverse um, experiences and individuals to the table to really understand each other and lay out that particular um, blueprint. With that, the, the foundation was very happy to be able to provide financial support to move this along because we knew we had the coalition of individuals willing to do that. But we also needed staff on the ground here in Green Bay. Um, so outside our financial support, we allocated Rashad Cobb from our staff who's here with us today to be our coordinator on the ground here in Green Bay. But we also had to seek out experts around the country who knew this work well. Um, and we're very happy today to introduce Amy Stetzel who comes to us from the Corporation of Supportive Housing, who's been working with Rashad, our task force, and community leaders all across the region to really begin to understand and discover what, it, what homelessness and its root causes mean here in Green Bay and how we can begin the planning process, which we're about halfway through right now. So I'm gonna turn this over to both Amy and ultimately Rashad to kind of talk a little bit about their perspective in our community and where we are today. So Amy and Rashad. Wonderful. Thank you, Dennis, and good evening, everybody, and thank you for, for letting us be here. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight to talk to you about what we've been up to. Um, and, and so first of all, as Dennis said, my name is Amy Stutzel. I am the Upper Midwest Director for the Corporation for Supportive Housing, otherwise known as CSH. Uh, CSH is a national nonprofit. We're headquartered in New York City, but we have 20 regional offices all over the nation. And one of those offices is in Minnesota. And we we work with folks in the five state region. So um, we work with folks in North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, all on a host of different in interventions and strategies with the ultimate goal, goal of increasing housing stability for the citizens of those states. Um, and so I'm just thrilled that we're able to partner with everybody in Green Bay to do this work, to build out this blueprint. We've we've done this in other areas. Um, we. We actually just last year built a blueprint with the city of Rochester in Minnesota where Mayo Clinic is located. Um, and they're a very similar size city. They have very kind of similar size uh, of issue of people experiencing homelessness. And so um, we're taking what we've learned from that community, but we're also really sitting and listening and hearing from all of you to to hear what is unique to Green Bay, what is unique to Brown County, what is unique to the region, and how does that fit within within the state as well? Um, and so again, we're we're thrilled to be doing the work. I know Rashad and I always joke where I think we just finished our 16th listening session. Um, a handful of you were a part of those sessions, so uh, we're we're taking all of that wisdom and knowledge and data and ma and marrying that with quantitative data that we've been pulling as well. So now we're in the phase of bringing all of that information together. We'll be issuing a draft uh, blueprint that we will uh, bring back to everyone that came and were a part of those listening sessions. So everyone can say, hey, this looks right. Um, or you you heard me and and this is this is exactly what I said, or you missed it and this is what I actually meant, um, or this piece is missing. And so people get a second bite at that apple, and then we're hoping to have a final draft plan um, in front of the Leadership Council and, and out to the community in September. Um, so that's kind of the timeline that we're on right now and where we're at in the process. Um, but as Dennis said, I couldn't do any of this without Rashad, who's on the ground. He is he is the connection point to all of you in Green Bay. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Rashad. 
And Amy, before you do that, could you yeah. just maybe talk a little bit about <clears throat> what the definition of success looks like for this particular project? Yes, absolutely. And I'm wondering, I know we sent over some slides and I don't know how easy it is to pull those up or not. And we don't have to. Um, uh, yeah. Hello, this is Celestine Jeffries. I'm the clerk. So I can pull those up right now. And then when you're ready to go to the next slide, just let me know. Wonderful. If you could actually just go to slide number four, that's in that deck that we sent over. Great. Perfect. And there's actually some animation that goes with this and, I, and I'll let you know when to hit click on that. So hopefully this works on Zoom. I, I, in some of these uh, uh, platforms, the animation piece doesn't work. But something that, that we, uh, both the National uh, Interagency Council on Homelessness as well as the State of Minnesota Interagency Council on Homelessness where I worked for the past five years uh, um, out and implement a statewide plan to prevent and end homelessness, uh, we, we have this definition of homelessness, which is really saying an end to homelessness doesn't mean that no one will ever experience a housing crisis again because of changing economic realities, unpredictably, unpredictability of life and unsafe or unwelcoming family environments may create situations where individuals, families, or youth could experience or be at risk of homelessness. But when we say we'll end homelessness, what that means is that we will prevent homelessness whenever possible by decreasing the number of individuals and families that become homeless. So if you click that, let's see if it shrinks down. Oh, you know what? It might not work, uh, which is fine. So we'll prevent homelessness whenever possible, right? We're going to make homelessness rare by really increasing the number of housing possibilities we have for people throughout the state. So increasing that arrow, um, um, increasing access to housing in whatever way we can. We're going to make each episode of homelessness as brief as possible. So shrinking the length of time people are experiencing homelessness to shrink and reduce the trauma that's inflicted on adults and children um, who, when they experience homelessness. And then we're going to end that continuous cycle of homelessness, right, by putting supports in place to ensure that people don't keep continually falling back into homelessness once they stay in the house, we often see generational homelessness happening. That's come up a lot in our listening sessions that folks are seeing, and, and we want to make sure that, that that ends, that cycle ends. So that's the definition of homelessness that we're operating under um, with this blueprint and this plan. Thank you for bringing up those slides. And thank you for that. Oh, oh for that extra clarification and just wanted to say thank you, uh, Mayor Ginnerick and to all of the, uh, the city council members for having us today. Um, just really excited to be here. Uh, we're here because we want you, but more importantly, we actually, we're here because we need you for this work to, in, in order for this work to be done. And so what I wanna talk about a little bit is some of the things that we've done, just kind of a, a, reham a rehashing of the, of the timeline. We kicked off this project in late September, early October with an announcement to the community. Um, pretty much stating what Dennis had said in his opening around the reasons why we wanted to do this project. From there, we actually dove into a, a two month, two and a half month, um, what do you wanna call it here? An activity of reaching out to all of the different systems in our community where ind individuals who might uh, be facing homelessness or who are homeless might intersect. And so we did a real big data dive, just reaching out to a number of different entities around the community to, uh, to get real time numbers on what homelessness looks like in our community. Not just those individuals who are visible, but also individuals who may not be as visible to individuals who don't work um, in, in the housing space. And so that was a very interesting community oriented uh, participating event. Got, a lot, got an opportunity to learn a lot myself uh, through that work. We took that data, um, Amy and I and, and her team, we, we looked it over and then we did a big presentation to the entire community. Uh, we did that in December of this year. If you weren't able to join that uh, particular session, it's actually housed on the Greater Green Bay Community Foundation website. And what I can do is I can pass that, um, that link on to Mayor Ginrich so he can share it with you all if you're interested in taking a look at that. But what we did was we, uh, we laid out that data as we knew it, as we had received it for the community to see and, and really asked for their input and did it make sense um, we got some good feedback from that. And so then what we got to do next was my favorite part of the project to date is we actually set up listening sessions. Uh, 
Initially, I thought I was going to run Amy away with my idea of wanting to conduct 16 listening sessions, but she was gracious and understood that, um, you know, for our community, we definitely wanted to try to capture as many voices as possible. And so she was 100% uh, supportive of us doing those listening sessions. To kind of give you some context on who we spoke to for those listening sessions, we started off initially with working with individuals who work um, in shelter facilities. Is um, but we broke that up into different sections. And so we had the executive directors and uh, executive level staff have their own listening session, which was separate from directors and management, which was also separate from frontline staff. I wanted to provide frontline staff members an opportunity to say things that they see without any fear, um, without any fear from having their bosses present. And I, I think that that um, was accomplished in setting it up that way. We also worked with government and policymakers. I wanna thank some of you who are on this call today for showing up and lending your voice and opinions to that. Um, we had an opportunity to talk to law enforcement, courts, people who work in the coordinated entry system, some of our nonprofit and community members who work in uh, serving older adults and individuals with disabilities. We also had an equity focused um, listening session as well. And so I just kind of rambled off a few of those to give you an idea of how broadly we really tried to cast our web to make sure we, we captured voices. Um, we didn't want people's uh, opportunity to lend their voice to be restricted by time. And so for anybody who had reached out and expressed a desire to participate but was unable to because of the time we had selected, we also afforded people an opportunity to respond directly to me with the questions that Amy and I had actually uh, to send, uh, had asked during the listening sessions. And so we have had some more community members reach out with uh, uh, with questions about still being able to participate. And I'd like to graciously offer you all that opportunity as well. Um, again, Rashad Cobb, I can be found at the Community Foundation. If you'd like to try to weigh in on some of these uh, these questions or just general opinions, please reach out via email and I'll make sure to get you those questions and uh, we welcome your input as well. Um, and so where we're at now is we're, we're at uh, a part in the process where we're actually capturing lived experience. So we've got the data, We've got some input from people on the ground who do the work and, and serve those community members, but I don't think you can design anything for any particular group without having them at the table. Um, and so we're trying to do that in an authentic way, working directly with the individuals who lead our, um, our shelters and other uh, entities in the community. And I'll explain what I mean by other entities in a second, but really working with those six <clears throat> entities here who, who provide housing and shelter for individuals who are facing housing insecurity and they're working with their staff to best disseminate that information. We didn't wanna walk into their space and say, this is the best way to capture lived experience from those that you serve. And so we provided them with the materials and they're now all in the process of uh, gathering that lived experience uh, input from those that we wanna hear from. I'm actually gonna be going to some of those, um, some of those nonprofit organizations to explain to people who are asking for their voice, why we want their voice and what we're gonna do with their voice. We think that's important as well. Um, and then when I talk about other entities, I think sometimes people have a, a decent understanding of the fact that you can look at a new community shelter, a St. John's, a House of Hope, a Golden House, a Freedom House, I think I got them all. Um, and you know, that may be like, that may limit your, your understanding of homelessness in our community, but we also have a, a lot of unseen homeless individuals in our community. And so with that, I reached out to places like We All Rise, African American Resource Center, I reached out to Comsa, I reached out to Casa Alba, and there are a couple other places in this community where they themselves may not operate as shelters, but they have really close on the ground connections to people who are experiencing some of these ills that we're trying to overcome. And so bring that, that information for that lived experience, we're gonna marry that all together with the data I talked about earlier, um, the input from those who are on the ground serving those community members. And much to Amy's point, we're gonna produce um, a document that really says this is what we heard, but then we're gonna circle back to all of those people who provided input just to make sure that we um, that we analyzed everything properly to give them a second bite as, at the apple, as Amy mentioned. Um, and then from there, we'll actually go back and develop our blueprint um, that we wanna to release to the community that actually is gonna give everyone in the, in the community an opportunity to, um, to solve this problem. Because I think one of the things that's become really evident through these listening sessions as themes emerge is that it's gonna take a combination of philanthropy and funding, um, policy makers, landlords, uh, our, our law enforcement officers. There's just a lot of ways that our community, our entire community can intersect around this issue to try to solve this problem. And so that's it for my contributions. But if people had questions or if anyone from our task force team had any additional ads they wanted to make, please feel free to do so. Well, thank you all for that presentation. Uh, thanks specifically to you, Rashad, for all the work that you've done on the ground doing that outreach. 
um, soliciting that input that is so valuable from the providers and, and from those folks in the community who are experiencing homelessness. Really appreciate the, the ambition uh, of what you have laid out and your ability to execute that. Um, and thanks to Amy, of course, from CSH and the whole team for all the work that they have done. Um, as I said, you know, one of the reasons for inviting you in was because of this discussion about um, about some of the programming over at at St. John's Park. So I'll just kind of kick things off with with one question, and then turn things over to council. Um, you know, don't want to get necessarily too specific into this this particular program, but was just curious if uh, if either Rashad or Amy um, could talk about you know maybe what has been contemplated in other communities um, to to reach some of those folks who are some of the most difficult to house, um, those that are, are actually homeless on the streets. Um, you know, the, when you talk about homelessness, it's a very complicated um, population and it encompasses all, all sorts of different challenges. Um, but one of, you know, one of the issues that we've discussed here recently is that population that's kind of visible, right, on the streets and, and in St. John's Park, for example. So I was, was wondering um, if you all could just speak to that, that issue sort of generally and how that might be addressed in the, in the plan that's to come. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I can, I can talk, speak to uh, work we've done in other communities, um, for sure. In Rochester, Minnesota, the reason they actually had us come and, and work on their plan is that um, in Minnesota, I don't know if they have these in Wisconsin, but they have these things called skyways, which are like elevated hallways between buildings because we're not as hardy as all of you in the winter and we wanna be in heated hallways <laughs> instead of walking on the street. Um, and they had a huge influx of unsheltered homelessness, uh, unsheltered homeless living in the skyways uh, about two years ago. And so they really brought us in to say, we don't know what's going on, like, but it, this is just, you know, it's a very, public, very visible, very in your face issue that we're dealing with. And so um, we did the same kind of process uh, that, that we're doing with all of you in Green Bay. And, and there's definitely, you know, there needs to be more kind of supportive housing development or increase to housing that's already in the community, but you just need to connect services to it. So you don't need to build more housing necessarily, but you really Really, actions really strong, uh, but something that we learned very quickly, and I think could potentially happen here in Green Bay as well. That was a great eye opener and a great exercise for all of us. Is that we said, you know, do we do we really know how many folks we have that are unsheltered? And and a lot of the outreach um, folks doing outreach were like, we know everybody, we know everybody who's out there, we know them by name, we see them every day. Um, and they didn't have the luxury of having a July point in time count like all of you do, which is a huge, huge benefit to your community. Um, and I think, I think will help us dramatically in this plan. Um, but so we basically had them do a summer point in time count where we said, you know, it was actually in October, but we said for these three days, we're going to take your outreach workers. We're, we're going to have you build a team of people where you are really going to go out. You're going to find everybody who's living unsheltered in the skyways or in tents or in parks, and you're going to get to know them. And you're going to, we're going to have a count of them. And we're also going to see if they're showing up in any of our systems. And what they found is that there were 35 people no one had ever met before who were either new or who'd been there all along. Um, and so, so everyone was surprised by that. And then out of the, it was actually 105 people total that they counted, 75 people they found out weren't actually in systems in the way that would guarantee that they'd be connected to services. They kept kind of falling out of line. They kept kind of falling out of service or kind of out of the prioritization line. There's a system called coordinated entry that many communities or all communities are supposed to be using that's mandated by HUD. Um, and so that helps prioritize people with the most needs. The folks that are living on the streets get connected to the services they need in a community. And so they found that the vast majority of these folks were through process, essentially, and policy decisions people were making, um, falling out of falling out of this prioritization. And so they fixed that. And once they fixed that, within one month, they had housed 40 of those folks. Um, and so I think there's some real potential to do some low cost, no cost work uh, right away from the get go. That's looking at policies we have that might be actually creating barriers that we just didn't anticipate that are being created. 
Um, I think there's some real potential and the community has really expressed this to look at the ways we're doing things that are maybe we're not talking to each other as well as we should be or could be, or maybe we think we're talking to each other well, but we're actually not. And so I think there's some some good synergy to be doing that work right away up front that could really help decrease some of the population that you all are seeing um, in the parks in Green Bay. Um, so we can do that work. We also need to do the hard work, right, of making sure folks are connected to the services they need, because you're absolutely right, Mayor, that um, these folks, they you don't just become chronically homeless. It is a long path to get there, right? And so it's, there's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of substance use. There's a lot of years of usually mental health um, all of that wrapped up. And so there's a lot of services these folks need. Um, so there'll, there'll be some heavy lifting to address that long-term uh, for, for that deep end set of, of folks. But I think there's actually some um, kind of systems and policy work we can do to, to, get, to get people housed or get them connected to services that can make a massive impact for them right away. Uh, that being said, the other piece of the work that Continuum I've kind of talked about is going to be addressing how do we stop people from getting to that end point? How do we make sure people are caught way up here? Um, they stay stably housed. They get access to mental health that they need before it gets really bad. They get access to the to chemical dependency help that they need before it gets really bad. So doing all of that kind of upstream preventive work that at the end of the day, is not just good for human beings, but is good for budgets as well. It saves a lot of money too. Um, so th that's that's what I'm thinking about a lot. Uh, Rashad, Robin, or Dennis, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'll, I'd like to just add um, something. I'd like to go back to you know, what Robin mentioned earlier when Robin and I came together early in this process and spoke about this. Um, the Foundation the United Way find themselves, as I mentioned earlier, really at the, the confluence of policy leaders and nonprofits and other community leaders and understanding where they intersect with these issues. And I think we just had to be honest with ourselves. And we, we had a lot of conversations with the, co the housing coalition, with our own staff to understand what Amy said earlier, that we as a community, and this isn't being critical, that many of our organizations and leaders were not communicating across organizations as well as we could have in understanding what our common goal is and where, do, what role do we play together to getting toward that solution that Amy laid out earlier. So it, it required us to go to those, those discussions and say, let's just acknowledge that maybe it's not working as well as we all hope. And let's just acknowledge that our goal is to really affect those who are not at the table right now. That's our goal. And we need to do that better. And I think our ability to look at some of the the simple tasks of communication and the simple tasks around coordination of, of how we connect people with services. There is, there are some low hanging fruit that we can address that can start to have an impact earlier if we simply are bold enough to lay out a blueprint or a plan that identifies where each one of us can play a role and we agree on where that role is. Um, we saw some of that play out during the pandemic where we saw real issues that were uncovered because of, of the restrictions around the pandemic. And we, we know we provided funding to help some of the healthcare systems in county and, and law enforcement try to, to rectify some of the issues that were happening because of beds and transition, et cetera. And there are a lot of those things by just simply communicating better and understanding our role that we can begin to solve um, that are systemic issues that we can solve. And it's just important. So this is as much about process and understanding so we come to a common agreement as anything else, um, as opposed to just saying, well, we need X more units or X more this or X more programs. We may have units and programs and staff, and, but how can we use those better in combination with whatever the longer term need is as well? Uh, Rashad, I'm sorry if I, I stepped over there for me. No, that was fine. The only thing I was gonna add is just a, a, a brief statement from a conversation that Amy and I had um, two or three sessions into getting to know each other. And, and it was just a pretty direct question I asked her. And I said, can we do this? I said, you're like, I'm not recording this conversation. It's just you and I here. Can we do this? Because I'm worried that was set up, you know, to, to end homelessness. That's, that's a really big um, statement. And, you know, and she said that we can, we, we've got the right people in place. 
through those listening sessions, she's heard that, we've, you know, we've got, she's seen firsthand that we've got committed nonprofit members or uh, staff members and, and other individuals, because again, it just doesn't fall on nonprofit organizations. You know, we've got policymakers at the table. So it, it's something that actually can be done. This is something that's within our reach if we just come together and do um, what it takes to get done. And so that's one of the things that I like to convey too, is that it's actually possible. And I'll share something I know I've shared with Robin, which is uh, I grew up in this community, like many of you did. This is my hometown. I went away as, as Mayor Gingrich knows for a good long while. I've lived in Milwaukee for many years where there is very serious um, both segregation and homeless issues. I spent a fair amount of time in Portland, Oregon, where the homeless issue, as many of you know, is um, beyond overwhelming. Uh, to a point now where it's, it's it's even hard to understand where you even start. And I think many of the leaders there would acknowledge that. Um, coming back to be able to solve issues that we're trying to solve and to see where we are in this community, I agree with Amy and I agree with Rashad, and I know I've shared this with Mayor and with Robin, we can solve this. Um, it just requires the courage and intent of everyone on this call and the people who aren't on this call to say that we're going to put a plan together, understand our role, and we're going to tackle that for the benefit of those who aren't on this call right now. And if that's our goal, then we can solve this. And I absolutely agree with Amy and Rashad that we can do that. Very well said, I appreciate uh, those responses. And like I said, now I'll, I'll open things up to council. Looks like Alder Stoyer has a question for you all, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Mayor. First, first of all, I'd like to thank Dennis, Robin, Amy, and Rashad for this presentation. Very, very important. Uh, I was proud to be part of that effort seven years ago with uh, Alder Burnett, Alder Tim Duane, and Alder uh, Dave Boyce. We were on a homeless, it's called the Hope Task Force, and we had 40 different people from around the community. The main goal that we were working on back then was trying to get a resource center, you know, take the pressure off of the library and other places for, for homeless folk and such. And I, I like the tenor of this discussion because you're actually looking at you know, literally trying to end homelessness where seven years ago we were just looking for a solution to one of the problems that was there. So I think one of the things um, I'm going to get involved with, and I know that other alders will do as well, uh, to be, you know, I'd like to be part of a subcommittee with the Brown County Housing Authority looking at affordable housing. And I think that that's coming up very shortly. So I'm going to be involved and look at land use and zoning and uh, availability and affordability. And then that's one, one of the big issues. There's, you know, 15 or so systemic issues with homelessness, but that's one of the main ones. So I, I definitely want to be involved with that and others will, will as well. So I just want to thank you for the presentation. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, there Other questions or comments? One, Mayor. Alder Dorf, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so here you are tonight in front of City Council. You've given a great presentation. And do you know yet what you want from City Council? What what should we be thinking about doing? Or do, do you not know yet? You're just giving us, like, this is the very first description, and then there's going to be the blueprint, and then you want something from us, but I'm here and I just want to know what can I do to support you if you know? Well, I, I guess what I'd like to say first is I'd like to thank you for showing up to one of the listening sessions and participating. Uh, I think that was definitely a, a huge first step in being part of, of the solution. Um, you know, Amy and I talk about this often about being careful about laying out specifics before the plan is actually baked. We're really still putting all of those ingredients together um, we really want to hear, especially from those individuals with lived experience, and we won't have all of that information back. But there are some clear things that people who have been coming to some of these listening sessions have suggested. We just need to go back through all of those contributions and really f figure out how we are going to um, present those to you all in a way that makes sense. You know, whether, whether we're breaking those off as cost neutral, um, you know, things that are just going to have a cost, things that might be low hanging fruit, uh, quick wins but we haven't taken the time yet to, to actually, because we just finished up the 16th listening session last week, Thursday. Um, and so we haven't had an opportunity to spend time together to pull out exactly um, what we're gonna need from policymakers um, like yourselves, but um, that is to come for sure. 
Thank you. I just wasn't sure I was, I understood the purpose of tonight. I understand it more clearly now. This was basically an introduction, a description. Uh, there's more to come, so get ready for it. But right this second, Barb, you don't have to do anything, right? I, I don't have to do anything right this second. And, and Robin, just okay. really quick, I, I would say that the other opportunity that people have is again, um, Rashad Cobb at Greater Green Bay Community Foundation, ggbcf.org. Um, if people still want to weigh in, we're not closing the door on that opportunity. So if people still want to lend some of their experience, expertise to this conversation, please feel free to do so by reaching out. Sorry, Robin. No, that's that's fine. That's that's perfect. And then I would add, now that you've been in the session and you've heard the update, um, then the next time, if there is a next time that someone says, oh, I heard there's a plan to X, Y, Z, you now have the knowledge to say, I was in a presentation and that's actually not what's happening yet. Here's what's happening next. So when I was at Freedom House, people would say, well, I don't wanna to give to you, so what else do you want? And I said, well, now you're armed with knowledge. So now I need you to share that knowledge, right? Because there's a lot of myths that are out there and we need the more people who hear what's actually happening, then that's the message that can go forward. So that's something that we can all do. Um, even though tonight isn't the, hello, city council, we need you to do X, Y, and Z. And thank I'd you. Like for to, I'd like to make note too. I think that sometimes with things like this, there could be a tendency to want to put borders on something and say, well, this is a state issue, a county issue, a city issue, an economic issue. Um, so as you address those, give us the plan and come back and then let us know what you need. You know, I would make the point this is a human issue. Um, that isn't defined by borders. And all of us play a role in that as we've said all along. And the role of council in Green Bay or in De Pere or of, of the county or nonprofits, program leaders or executives, philanthropies, we all have a different part of that. And I think as Amy and Rashad and the task force and team begin to put that plan together, it's bringing everyone along here to understand now, where can I play that role? in partnership with others in that plan so that we really we really affect this. And, and I, it's been really heartening to see people, I think, gravitate to that idea and come to it together as opposed to, well, it's this issue or that issue and we'll wait to kind of see the plan on that. So again, I would I reiterate what Rashad said, appreciate all of you who have been participating in those sessions and lending that perspective because every single one of those perspectives is gonna be found within how Amy and her team help us construct some proposals about how we can work on that together as neighbors to address this. Thank you. Great, thanks for those comments and that question, Alder Dorf. Alder Johnson and then Alder Scannell. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just like others, wanna reiterate as well our gratitude for coming to educate members of, of our community here on, on what we can do to be a part of the solution. One of the things, Amy, in particular that, that you highlighted that was of interest to me, probably because I just read an article about this in um, Next City, which is a, you know, a blog that talks a lot about you know, how to grow successful cities. Um, and it was how Bakersfield, California ended the homelessness problem that they had. And one of the things that they talk about is the by name list and in case conferencing, right? Where basically you work with individuals and understand what their need is and, and why they're, you know, why they're finding themselves uh, unsheltered and what we can do to solve that problem. An example they gave, you know, was an individual who didn't want to move into a unit because, and so they bought a microwave and the problem was solved. And I think we all have to understand, right? They're from different backgrounds, different perspectives, where maybe that wouldn't be an impediment to our decision, you know, homelessness or a microwave. But but we all come from different different backgrounds and experiences, and sometimes a, a solution may be just simple if we understand the root cause on an individual uh, basis or a micro basis. So um, I just wanted to highlight that because I think the fact that you talked about that, the fact that I just recently read that that was – um, you know, recognized as a model that worked really well in a community of comparable size with comparable demographics. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, it worked elsewhere. Why wouldn't it work here? And clearly you guys have that as one of the solutions on the table. So it's exciting sometimes when you see that synergy 
um, and recognize that that's something that could really work for us. And so I applaud the work and effort you're doing. I mean, this is this is literally God's work. I mean, this is very hard, very labor intensive work uh, that requires a lot of patience. And it just certainly takes um, a very compassionate, empathetic human being to know how to handle these situations. And so thank you for for what you're doing for our community. Thank you, Alder Johnson, for, for that comment. I, I I love you had read that article. The the by name list idea, I'll tell you, uh, in Minnesota, we are this close to ending veterans homelessness because that's how we did it. Um, there are 10, they're called continuums of care across the state of Minnesota, which they're in Wisconsin as well. I think there are four or five. Um, but it's essentially all of the housing and, and home as a continuum, and that's how federal HUD dollars are going to spread out throughout the whole state. Um, but the state of Minnesota said, let's get all of the veterans experiencing homelessness on a list, and we're going to go through them one by one, and we're going to get all the right people in a room, and they'd literally put their names up on it, would do that case conferencing. And they got people housed just left and right doing it that way. Um, and so I love that you brought up that example and that's what worked in Rochester too. So um, thank you, thank you for reiterating that. And I also love the, the conversation or the story about a microwave. There's a story in Minnesota we often tell about um, a woman who would not move into housing and we finally realized she uh, wanted her cat to come with her and nobody wanted the cat. And so, um, but we finally found a landlord who said, I'll take the cat if you get it spayed. So we used homelessness dollars to get the cat spayed. And when, uh, when, when the people who cook the books, um, or not cook the books, but who do all the budgeting in Minnesota, um, when they said, why did you spend money on getting a cat spayed with federal dollars? We said, that's how we got somebody into housing. So at the end of the day, you either pay for a spade cat or you pay for somebody to be living on the streets for years and years and years. So thanks for, thanks for bringing up that example. Thanks, Amy. Alder Scannell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you all for, for this presentation. It, it's been very good. And, uh, and I'm sorry I missed some of the listening sessions. I, I can't remember why I, I couldn't make them, but I, I hope I can reach out to you in the, in the future here and, and share some ideas. I, I do see this as a, a continuum of services, as Amy just met, got done mentioning. Uh, and are you far enough along uh, in your work for Green Bay here? Do we have gaps in our services? And do you have uh, uh, an idea of how we can fill those gaps or is that still in the planning stages? I think we're still really taking a look at that and like really doing the assessment now of what we've heard from people. Um, it might not necessarily be gaps. The gap might just be a communication issue um, or there might be gaps that need to be filled. So I think we are still really figuring that out, but um, definitely will, that'll be part of the analysis that we do. So thank you for raising that. Yeah, and, and I, I appreciate also that, uh, like with the, uh, the example you gave with the veterans, but it's, it's been my a uh, little bit of a frustration point for me um, that th there are there appears to be some confidentiality issues to the point where I mean even when a, a homeless person dies on our street for his during the, the service to commemorate his his uh, passing they can't they don't even mention his name <laughs> it it you know it which just is I mean it's just so how dehumanizing that you can't even have your name read out uh, to commemorate your death. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping we can uh, work through some of these issues to really move forward. Um, uh, thanks. Thanks, Alder. Um, Alder Stoyer, I see you there. Are there any other Alders who haven't spoken yet? And then I'll go to Alder Stoyer for a second time. All right, Alder Stoyer, go ahead. All right, I'll keep this short, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I was just going to ask the, the folks that presented today. Uh, I think one of the issues we dealt with seven years ago were there were a lot of different uh, nonprofits, a lot of different uh, county groups, some city groups, and there was this tendency to kind of fall into a silo mentality where they kind of held on to what they were working with. I'm just wondering, with this plan coming forward, has that been addressed? kind of put that down and, and try to work together and coordinate rather than maintaining your your silo and your funding and whatever else comes into play with that 
Yeah, Alder, I'll go back to the, my really very first stops that my staff and I, along with Robin and her staff, made um, in engaging was the uh, Brown County Coalition on Homelessness and Housing. Um, I think we all acknowledge, I think everyone in that room acknowledged that there were silos that existed. And we as funders don't like to see those silos. We want to see people working better together. Um, and we had to open work early on to get them to the table um, and connect them with this work deeply. And we just had to acknowledge they existed and those can't exist for us to go forward. Uh, but for them not to exist, they have to be at the table being a part of that solution. And that's been a big part of what Rashad and Amy have been doing and working directly with those organizations, um, bringing the leadership of the coalition along with us on the task force represented by um, and I know that Rashad, and we don't have to get much detail about this, and our time is probably running a little bit short in your agenda, but I know that um, Rashad was noting the other day about feedback we're starting to get from nonprofits about the fact that they're starting to communicate and understand each other in ways that they haven't for many years. Now, I'm not going to call that a problem solved. I think everyone would admit we have a long way to go yet, but we're starting to see um, little moments of progress. Um, that didn't exist um, within those those relationships for many, many years. And those are tough discussions because we have to sit in a room and acknowledge something that people have a hard time acknowledging, that we're not talking, we're not communicating. Um, and I think that the great fortune of, and I feel very blessed to have a partner in Robin Davis and both our staff that work really well together and have honest discussions because I think we, we bring a place of neutrality, just wanting to get people to work together. Uh, we're not as embedded in those, I think, long relationships that maybe cause those silos. So we can help facilitate that and navigate that, I think, in a way that's about getting people to the solution we're trying to achieve. Um, so Alder Stoyer, I would not say that we are where we need to be yet. I don't think anyone would, but it's certainly nice to start at least experiencing what seems to be some progress moving along in that direction. Um, thank you for that. Thank you. And also, I'd like to add, I just think that having uh, an outside entity come into the community assists with that as well. Um, it allows people to to receive and, and, and view what we're going to create um, <clears throat> with their guards down, right? Like, there's, there should be no competition in this. This is an outside entity coming in, capturing our voices and saying, here's what we think is best. Here are the opportunities. Right. And so I, I, think that that, I think that that is a, a, another huge uh, piece of the puzzle in this particular uh, right. equation. Right. Rashad, Rashad, I, I'm no. sorry, I think it, it's worth, I, I should have mentioned it's worth noting, um, we said this in a previous discussion, it is not a small thing, I think, to be able to say that we have alignment between the United Way, the Foundation, the Chamber, the Mayor's Office, the County Executive's Office, um, having the weight of community leaders coming together and saying this is important sends a strong message to our nonprofit leaders that we're here to help support your hard work and what you're doing every day. Um, and we think that that's really, really important. And I appreciate very much uh, Mayor and County kind of Executive Streckenbach and both of our staff's um, ability to come together and, and I think use that weight. Rashad, could you give me your uh, uh, email address one more time for all of us? That's all I have then. It is R A S H A D C O B B as in boy boy at G B wait G G B C F dot org. Forgive me okay. because I worked at the Boys and Girls Club and it's B D G C so it's club. But Greater Green Bay Community Foundation, G G B C F dot org. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Thanks, Alder. It looks like Alder Lefebvre has a question. Well, what I was going to ask is that maybe uh, Celestine could send out um, to the presenters uh, tonight, send the uh, contact information. That might be easier, you know, so that if something comes up that, you know, we have questions or whatever, that we can contact them. Yep. And, um, and Rashad referenced the web page earlier on in the presentation. That is included in your packet. That, uh, that URL. Um, so if you click that, you'll have all the information at your fingertips. Any final questions or comments from our council? All right, 
we will cut you loose, but really very appreciative um, to everyone who's played such an instrumental role in bringing us to this point. Um, I'm inspired and excited by what we have in front of us. Um, it's it's an enormous challenge that we that you know we're still going to need to confront. Um, but I think we're, we are at a unique point having this alignment between uh, the nonprofit community providers of, of homelessness services and the city and the county. So I am prepared to do the work. I know uh, many folks on our common council are as well. So look forward to the final document um, in the months ahead and, and really getting to work on it. So thanks again for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Thank you, everybody. On to ordinances, second reading for adoption. Move to suspend the rules. Second. Alder Dorf makes a motion to suspend the rules and take up these ordinances with one roll call vote. That was seconded by Alder Johnson. All in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it, the rules are suspended. Move to approve or adopt, sorry, move to adopt. And second. Alder Dorf makes a motion to adopt. That was seconded by Alder Lefebvre. Any comments or questions on those ordinances? All right, please use the board. All those you may vote. Oh, I see. I'm a yes. I, I don't see mine coming up. I all those story votes yes as well. Thank you. And it uh, looks like we're missing a vote from. I will mark Alders um, Stevens. Are you a yes? Yes, it's not showing up, but yes. Okay, thank you. I have all 12. All right, that is 12 0. Those uh, items are adopted. On to the report of the RDA. Motion to approve. Second. Motion. Here, I'd like to pull number one. Yep, motion to approve made by Alder Johnson. Seconded by Alder Dorf. Sounds like Alder Vanderlees would like to pull item one. Any others? All right, item one will be handled separately. Hearing none others, all in favor of approving the remainder of that report, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. Uh, that report has been approved with the exception of item one. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Dorf. That item was pulled by Alder Vanderleest. Alder, you have the floor. Yes. Uh, could you just give us a brief, uh, first from the, uh, give us a brief, uh, just on, on that agreement itself, just a little briefing on the agreement itself. I, I've had a constituent ask me about it and I said I'd definitely, you know, get the information. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a, it's a very good request. So I will turn things over to Director Steck Schulte. I know that we are joined by uh, Merge Urban Development as well. Uh, so we might want to open the floor at, uh, at a certain point here. But uh, at this time, I'll turn things over to Director Steck Schulte. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Alder Vanderleest. Excellent question. Happy to provide a brief overview. <clears throat> I said, certainly this project has been one that was uh, one of the first ones I took a look at as I, as I started here just over three months ago. This has been one that's been worked on by staff for quite some time. Um, the project itself is, a, is two four-story mixed-use buildings with about 225 units of market rate uh, apartment housing. There's about 4,000 square feet of commercial space also included in, the, in one of the buildings. Uh, the building one's completion date is by the end of 2023. Building two, two's completion date is by the end of 2025. Uh, we're estimated it's a minimum construction cost of 25 million. The developer has to show hard construction costs of at least 25 million. Uh, in conversations with our assessing department, we're looking at kind of requiring a $21 million project value uh, as a minimum to come in on that project to qualify for the, the assistance as it's provided. Um, it can drop a little bit. It can come in lower than that, but there's a prorated amount down for assistance if it comes in with a certain range. So, so those numbers, kind of those trigger points, would be in order to get full assistance, they would, you know, basically they would have to be at 18.75 million to 
qualify for even a prorated amount, they would have to be at least $15 million. Uh, by all accounts, uh, our assessing department has generally been pretty conservative on those estimates. So we think it's more likely to increase, not decrease. Uh, so again, their projection is at $21 million. We think that's probably likely to come in a little higher than that. The city has, uh, as part of our commitment in terms of the assistance to the developer over time, uh, that's a maximum of $7.5 million over the life of the district. That is based on 70% of the annual increment being provided to the developer over time on a pay-as-you-go basis and 30 percent being retained by the city to cover a uh, various variety of infrastructure costs and other investments that we need to make in the area uh, these particularly include certainly the Arndt street and bridge street kind of installation and extensions that we need to take care of there's also a phase one of uh, the shipyard recreation improvements that are going to be required there uh, that includes uh, some of the waterfront improvements uh, certainly mentioned the street improvements uh, including some of the things like the floating dock the kayak launch and the trail that's going to be along the waterfront are kind of the first phase of doing this in previous discussions uh when i think when this council had discussed this back in 2018 there was looking at putting a, a large amount of the all of the investments uh the public investments and on an upfront basis uh alder weary i think this was a conversation you were having at that time with those folks we went back and toward back and got, got me uh, uh diana was good enough to find the minutes and so forth so we did re review those. Uh, we are using a, a phased approach for the public improvements in this case. So we are not putting all of the public improvements in all in, in advance. We are trying to kind of schedule them along with the phasing of the development. And that was a point of negotiation that we had to work with Merge on. They certainly requested all the improvements to be put in up front. Uh, but we simply said that that was we're, we're counting on the increment from the project to pay for as many of those much of those improvements as we can. So there are three specific phases for public improvements. Uh, I mentioned the, the, the kind of the waterfront improvements improvements and the street improvements. Phase two is more of the um, kind of, I think some of the great lawn, the park aspects of the project. And the, then the third phase of the project would be more related to the container park and kind of the entrepreneurship kind of project that that phase three that's going to be on that project. Um, and obviously, we haven't certainly none of these things have been bid at this point. Uh, we certainly have concerns, I think, as most um, public works, I'm sure our public works department, as well as private developers have in terms of managing costs, construction costs, what they are right now. Um, but we are certainly glad that the phased approach certainly helps us considerably in terms of being able to manage those costs and be able to totally value engineer anything that comes in uh, too high. We are also hopefully, I'll, I'm fingers crossed a little bit, we are also looking at uh, most of our Kind of crystal balls that we've looked at with a lot of our developers are looking at hopefully costs beginning to kind of come back down to normal probably end of fourth quarter of this year maybe first quarter of next year uh, so hopefully if that's the case uh, that will certainly provide some additional relief to some of the stresses we're seeing on construction costs right now at this time um, with that that's i guess a, a quick overview of that um alder at least if you have specific questions i'd be happy uh, to try to answer those What's the actual financial impact as far as when we first start putting in the roads and, and uh, you know, bringing that develop? Yep, the, uh, those phase can costs. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, we, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, this, the phase one costs we're looking at from can the waterfront me, improvements. Yep, can you hear, can you hear me, Alder Vanderlist? Okay, does everybody else hear me okay? Yes. I hear okay. you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the phase one waterfront improvements, the uh, kind of the remaining environmental work that needs to be done and some of the uh, other uh, habitat investment is, is probably right around between five and six million dollars. So obviously we'll have to borrow for some of those, those things. But we are looking at, the, there's a combination of the TID funds, several grants, including EPA funding and fish and wildlife funding that is paying, probably it looks like at least right now, uh, approximately about $650,000 of that work. Uh, the rest of that work is probably looking at going and being funded by the project through the through its TIF increment as it goes forward. Thank you very much for the information. Yes, sir. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, Alder, yep, Alder Lefebvre and then Alder Stoyer. Um, yes, uh, could you please tell me what the market value, um, market rate will be on those apartments? Let's see. I, I, I know the uh, Ms. Hanneman is here from Merge Urban Development would probably be able to better address that question, Alder Lefebvre. Um, Certainly could I entertain a motion to open the floor at this time. Move to open the floor. Yep. Second. Second. Made by Alder Dorf, seconded by Alder Weary. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The floor is open. 
Ms. Hanneman? Need you to unmute, Joy. <laughs> and if you could just state Hi. your name and, and address for the council for us and then, uh, and then go right ahead. Sure. Um, my name is Joy Hanneman. I'm with Merge Urban Development Group. My address is 1228 Brunette Towns Drive, Madison, Wisconsin. Um, market rate. So time will tell with us starting construction um, on the project in 2022 and completion by the end of 2023, um, we do expect um, the project costs to be driving rent. Obviously this is not a phenomenon that anyone is um, um, unfamiliar with, with housing prices and, and everything else. But what I can tell you is what we're renting today in a similar community and similar product type um, in the city of Oshkosh, we have studio units that are beginning around $800 a month. And our two bedrooms, um, two bed, two bath, um, largest units are around 1700 a month. The unit mix for the project will be um, studios, one bedrooms, and two bedrooms. Then, then I, I have a question that why did we, we pick this develop? I know there were two that had the proposals. I was wondering why we picked this because I'm sorry, 800 a month. Um, are you sure that we are going to have, that's just for a studio, that's a very small apartment. Are you sure that we're gonna have um, the people that can afford this? Uh, we have a lot of workers downtown and right now I don't know uh, their salaries in a way, but um, I think that's a little high. So just yeah, real, I know real the quick, other one we had a yeah. much better rate. We had much. Um, we had apartments that were lower rental. So just rates. real quick uh, on that, Alder. There there were two um, development groups that were interested in a planning option for Badger Sheet Metal, um, but but Merge is the only one um, who is going forward with a development agreement for this part of the of the shipyard. But uh, Ms. Hanneman, if you have any comments just on market analysis that you might have done in this area and and other communities. Yeah, certainly. Um, we do find that our units are very popular and the trends seem to be heading to the fact that people don't want roommates anymore. So we try to design our units small so that they can, um, I see one of the elder people there giggling um, about people not wanting roommates, but it's true. Um, people are really enjoying the fact that um, they can live alone and have a small unit in a great neighborhood. So uh, I can talk about the, you know, units that we're leasing in Ashkash. We are significantly pre-leased, and um, Stevens Point, comparable community, um, much smaller community where people are are very very excited about it opening. I'm just I'm just a little concerned because Whitney School. I don't know if that is still filled. I think they're still looking for, um, you know. A, quite a bit of rental in that unit. And I know I did look at it and all the apartments were very small. I, I just, you know, I have a little concern just to make sure that we can uh, fill the uh, apartments. Thanks, Alder. Look, just last report I had on Whitney School is, is that it was actually fully booked up. Okay. Um, uh, I believe Director Steck Schulte had his hand raised at a little while back to chime in. You're muted. Yeah, just to be consistent, this this project is very consistent with the city's housing study and and meeting a meeting is very specific target that matches within the market study that we've had uh, done earlier this year. So, okay. thank you, Director. Other questions or comments, Alder Weary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Ms. Hanneman, thank you for for being here today. Um, my question, just some general questions here. The parking, and, and I might have missed it when I was going through the. Is it underground surface combination of both? at grade actually so it's covered parking that is at grade just because of where the um the water table is in the, yep. on that site and then um also the surface parking that would be developed in conjunction with the two buildings okay and then um i think from the preliminary concept designs i saw <laughs> i always ask this question i saw some balconies is that you know everyone gets a balcony or at least half or i, I think that's an important for a, uh mm -hmm. for development to have balconies especially on the river Oh, absolutely. We are definitely planning to have balconies and the entire building design is 
meant to orient toward the water. I actually have um, a representative from the architectural team um, online today too. If you have any other architecture oriented questions, Steve Miller from Slingshot Architecture is available. I appreciate that. Um, do you have any preliminary leads on, on some of the commercial space? You know, is, is that uh, something you're confident you can, can fill? Yeah, definitely. It's, a, it's going to be a great neighborhood down there and they'll have a built-in user base um, with the number of tenants that will be locating in the shipyard, residential tenants. It's far too early for us to be soliciting um, users two years ahead of time before someone would be opening a business down there. But we've had great lease, lease um, activity in uh, on our other projects. All right. Um, I appreciate it. That's all I have right now. Thanks. Mayor? Alder, Alder Stoyer. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for, for that presentation, Joy. Um, I Actually, this is a question. Well, I, I don't know if I have any questions for Joy. I'd like to talk to staff. Should we, should I wait for that? Yes. No, all right. I, uh, all right. I, I, I like, okay. That's good. Great. Any other final questions or comments directed towards uh, Ms. Hanneman? All right. Thank you. Motion to close the floor. Yes. Thanks so much for joining us and for all the work on the project. Uh, motion has been made to close the floor. Okay. Second. Motion was made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Dorf. All in favor, I'll signify by saying aye. 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 His name. The ayes have it. The floor is closed. Alder Story. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this could be for Neil or for uh, for Diana. You know, I, I know we've talked about equalized value in, in the city of Green Bay and, and TIF being a, a tool that we can go up to 12%. I just want to know what we're, what the city with equalized value w w when it comes to TIF. I'm sorry, Alder, can you repeat the question? Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, didn't hear the whole question. Uh, okay, it was, um, just looking at the city of Green Bay, you know, that we've talked that TIF is a, a great tool for development that, you know, our equalized value, uh, if you can keep it under 12% that, that we're good at. I just wanted to know where the city is at right now with uh, equalized value with when it comes to TIF. It's, it's something over 7%. I can look it up right now, but um, it, we're around 7% out of the 12. Okay. And... And you feel confident that a project like this will work very well? Yes. Okay. All right. That's what I got. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Uh, Alder Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Just a couple of comments. Um, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with these folks for the last couple of years, and, and they really bring an innovative approach to how they handle urban development. And I think it's important for us to recognize that this is a lot that's not highly desirable because it does have challenges. It's had environmental contamination. Um, it, it's had, um, it's sat in the floodplain. And so we've got some issues that need to be addressed there. And quite frankly, in that area right now, there's not a lot that's really attractive uh, for, for new development. And that's the importance of a catalytic project like the shipyard. And so the shipyard is doing exactly what we wanted it to do. And it's attracting development like this. And as we talked about with the redevelopment authority, there's another couple of developers that are teed up and interested in the site across the street. So this is why we invest in these type of projects. But there's a, you know, a couple of things that I just want to highlight. When you look at the $21 million value of this project, a lot of times when we talk about, you know, when we do taxes and we talk about, hey, this is, you know, the average $150,000 home is sort of the baseline we use when we talk about this, right? So if you raise taxes, $150,000 home will pay this. Well, development of this size, folks, is worth 100, is the equivalent of 140 houses. 40 houses. It's important to put some context to that. And the other piece of this is that when you build a neighborhood with 140 houses, how much are you spending to construct those roads for 140 houses, to put in infrastructure for sewer and water? Um, how much does it cost to plow that? How much does it cost to do brush pickup, right? This property has none of that. So they're adding all the value, but they're not using any of the services or very few of them. So you're lowering a lot of that cost as well. We're still going to receive 30% direct increment on this, meaning that the cap on this project is 70% subsidy. 
So, so that's uh, so we're still receiving direct increment immediately into the levy. That's really significant because this is going to contribute immediate taxes. It's not not all delayed incentive, uh, or not delayed incentive, but it's not all delayed increment into the city's annual budget. A lot of the infrastructure, you know, that that's being supported over there, by the way, and I just want to give kudos, uh, obviously, to the whole team. But Matt Buchanan has done a lot of great work with writing the grants. We have EPA grants that have handled a lot of the environmental remediation, as well as some of the other uh, site challenges that have existed here, including geotechnical and some of the other things that have had to happen. Um, it's a pay go. There's no money up front. There's literally zero risk here for us. Even, I mean, even with the, the incentive built in, folks, we got $6 million roughly that is immediately tax paying, and it is not costing us a dime to see this hit the, hit the, hit the, uh, uh, to hit the levy every year. Um, and I appreciate Alder Lefebvre's um, comments about apartments. I think, you know, right now, that, that is, those are the going rates. Those are the going rates for these types of units, and it's based on construction cost. If we want, lower income apartments in our community obviously desperately needs those that's going to come typically through subsidies from the state and because this is a market rate i mean that's it's hard for us to dictate to a developer what their rent rate should be but quite frankly i don't know that's our concern because our concern in a project like this is increment how much value are you creating in taxes that's why we do tiff and so I think there are other developers that we can continue to work with on, on the rent rates, you know, that, that will obviously be more accessible and needed in our community. Uh, but this just unfortunately isn't the type of project where, where that, that dialogue uh, is important. Um, it's really about how much, how much value are they creating and how much taxes are they, they, they going to be paying when this project's complete. So I do fully support this, this project. My only concern, and I had this addressed at RDA and through some subsequent work with staff, was the calculations related to the shipyard because obviously this contractually obligates us to complete a project, but, I, but it is a project that we have previously authorized. And so this just puts timelines to it and so I think uh, what I really wanted to get from staff and, and uh, Director Stecksulte did this uh, was the, the calculations of how much increment needed to be created for us to ensure that the expenses or the investment related to shipyard was kept off the levy. And if, this, uh, if we approve this development agreement today, which I sincerely hope we can do unanimously, and we combine it with the value of the planning options being created across the street, we've already done we're already done <laughs> and we've got a long ways to go and a lot of opportunity in front of us uh to create even more value so i have i have all the faith in the world that the shipyard will certainly be kept off the levy and will be fully supported through those tiff and uh tiff investments in the new increment that that we're creating through these projects so uh that's all i've got mayor thank you thanks for those comments alder uh alder lefebvre for a second time um, yes, uh, I just want to ask the director too. Um, we are going to be looking at uh, doing some more affordable housing. I think that was in our plan, and I thought it was somewhere in that area. But I do know that where the shipyard is, uh, well, look at what's around there. There's it was more industrial and uh, businesses that were, you know, not the best. Uh, in that area. So this type of housing uh, makes sense because of the area. There's no, we're not moving out uh, low income people. You know, sometimes cities do that. They um, they build in and they move out the low income people. So um, yeah, I think this makes sense in that area. But I, I, I think we're still on track, aren't we? Still looking at um, the affordable housing. Absolutely, Alder. And it's certainly in terms of <clears throat> some of the other future projects that we're looking at, you know, um, developers are, are certainly learning and paying attention to the housing study that, that the city has performed. Uh, mm -hmm. As we're seeing letters of interest in planning options and things, they are coming in and they are telling us we are mar we are targeting this specific income level. <laughs> so they are, and that usually that comes that matches directly right out of our market study. So uh, we have one project that's, you know, we've, what we're seeing is a lot of the market rate projects and a lot of the affordable housing projects. And the affordable housing projects are very, as I think, Alder 
Johnson alluded to are very much tied to the WIDA tax credits programs mm -hmm. that are out there. Mm -hmm. So those are serving, I think, primarily, I think I believe that's 30, usually 30 to 80 percent of the area median income is kind of their targeted market that they go for. They usually target uh, veterans housing. They, they'll target housing for people with certain disabilities. Um, so very much uh, driven by the state tax credit program in terms of those programs. The other ones, such as this one, is more on the other side, the market rate. They're certainly usually because they can be TIF financed and they generate higher value, those can come in and, and are, are kind of more attractive for those cases. The unique one that we're looking at right now is actually targeting that right in the, right in the middle. So they've, they've seen the units that we're doing on the lower end. They've seen the units we're doing on the higher end. So now they're coming in and they're looking at right around, right at that area median income. Um, so they're, they are, by having that data available, that is definitely driving the process on that. And we certainly still do need units really across the board, but certainly in terms of the affordability uh, continues to be a challenge. And we're going to certainly be encouraging, uh, you know, we have, we've been attracting some very, I think it's certainly in terms of merge, uh, other other developers we're dealing with, we're very versed in those WIDA tax credits. So we are certainly looking for, looking to seeing additional housing units in that, certainly that 30 to 80 or that 30 to 60% of the area median income range in the very near future. I, I remember there was uh, the former mayor brought in uh, this gentleman. I cannot remember his name or what he was with, but he he came in and this is quite a few years ago. He had mentioned that neighborhoods that do well have a mixed uh, rental. Um, they have low income, mid and higher actually apartment buildings and in the surrounding community and it, it they're more viable. Uh, neighborhoods, they work much better than if we have, you know, up middle to upper in this area, and then all of a sudden you got the poor people in this area in the sub all subsidized housing all together. Uh, it doesn't work, and you've seen that in a lot of big cities. It just it causes a lot of problems, and they uh, found that it's more successful if we have them combined. Does that make sense? Absolutely, Alder, and I think not in terms only not only in terms of I think the physical location of projects, uh, certainly being in proximity to one another and, and sharing a same neighborhood, but also within individual within individual projects. So if someone's got 150 units, you know, someone coming in and, and actually mixing up the, the the rents and the income, you know, up applicability within that individual project, certainly is something we we would be encouraging as as, as staff. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Alder Brunette. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I just want to express um, complete confidence and support of the project. Thank you to staff, Mayor, your office, your staff, Alderman Johnson, RDA, all the others who were involved. I grew up in that neighborhood that will always be near and dear to my heart. I remember fishing along the river, playing, you know, admittedly on the coal piles, which is a big no-no, I know that. But the momentum is there that has never been there, at least from my memory, all the way back to when I was a little kid. The momentum is there and I don't wanna kill it. Now, if we were looking at redeveloping housing that was already there, tearing it down and building newer, higher cost housing, that's one thing, that's gentrification. That's not what we're doing. We're basically building something that isn't there. And we will be bringing value to that neighborhood and regarding the, I understand what you're saying, Alder Lefebvre, uh, Mayor, I understand what the Alder Lefebvre is saying is that, you know, we gotta be cognizant of the value of the housing, you know, the, the cost, the monthly cost, but you know, there are a lot of development that will come from that. And the, the restaurant, the type of restaurant, the retail, all the additional things will, that will grow from that development will bring value to that neighborhood. In addition, let's not forget, we did have neighborhood housing funds available to the neighborhood there as well to bring value to existing properties. So again, I just completely 100% on board with everything in regards to this project. Kind of took a bit of a hit when Breakthrough Fuel kind of opted out of that general area. And I think that this is the right direction. So just very thankful for everyone that was involved in this project. Thank you. Appreciate those comments. Alder Johnson for a second time. 
Thank you, Mayor. I, I meant to say this the first time and I forgot. And Alder Lefebvre uh, jogged my memory on this again. It, one thing that she mentioned, by the way, was talking about income diversification in neighborhoods, and she's absolutely right. There's a phenomenal book called Our Kids. I encourage all of you to, to give it a read, but it talks about that very foundation and the importance of that. Um, it, but but the concept of, um, uh, you know, obviously gentrification is a term that oftentimes gets thrown around very loosely and isn't always very applicable in, in the situations where it's being used. There's the point, we're not tearing down, we're not moving people out, we're literally creating more opportunity on a vacant piece of land. This is a good thing. Um, and, and, I, and I see this frequently, particularly in the social media chat boards that I know some of us get caught up in from time to time and maybe we shouldn't put a lot of stock in, but it's kind of like, oh, more overpriced apartments. And we have to understand folks that this is actually good to have these for low income folks in our, in our community. And here's why. The low income housing stuff, there's such a housing crunch right now. The low income is being occupied by moderate income and sometimes high income wage earners. They can afford more, but there's nothing on the market for them to move into. So they're occupying low income housing units because that, because landlords will look at, you know, options. I've got a moderate income or high income earner. They're going to so that person over someone who's low income because there's less risk for them. Uh, so, so this is good because it creates opportunities, moves those folks, frees up our low income units and, and creates more opportunity for our low income people. It's just a, a cycle that needs to occur, but it's an important one uh, that continues to contribute to our housing stock. And I just thought it was important for us to talk about that and recognize that when we add market rate apartments, it really is good for everybody. Thanks, Alder. Any final comments from council? Alder Gerlach. Your Honor, I am ready to vote in favor of this enthusiastically. <laughs> All right, appreciate that. With that said, we do have a motion and a second. All in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it unanimously. And that is approved. Thanks to council, thanks to staff, thanks most importantly to Merge Urban Development for having faith in, uh, in the shipyard. Uh, this is really exciting for all concerned. So thanks to everybody. On to INS. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve made by Alder Scannell, seconded by, was it Alder Galvin? Yep. And that's to approve the report of the Improvement and Services Committee from May 12, 2021. Any items here to be had? Hearing none, all in favor of approving that report, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it, and that report has been approved. P and P. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve, made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Corpus Dax. Uh, and that's to approve the report of the Protection and Policy Committee from May 10, 2021. And any items here to be handled separately? I think we have to do item 15. 15 will be handled separately. Any others? Hearing none others, all in favor of approving the remainder of that report, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The report has been approved with the exception of item 15. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Stoyer. That item was pulled by Alder Dorff. You have the floor. I only pulled it because I didn't see anybody else pulling it and no. I attended the meeting and I, I knew that we had to make a decision. So I, I have really nothing to say in it. I just okay. know that it's up to yep. us to make a decision. Yeah, thanks Alder. Maybe we'll just go to Attorney Chavez to recap the discussion at PNP um, so that we all have a good understanding. Thank you, Your Honor. So the issue in front of the council tonight is whether or not to grant an operator's license the committee, there was discussion about um, the applicant needing to pay up outstanding fines in order to qualify for, in order, um, we did receive verification from the police department today that although the applicant has made um, payments on the outstanding balances, that the balances have not been paid in full. 
Um, we also have additional information as to other fines that are outstanding, most of which are at the state level, not with the um, municipalities. So I think there is one with regards to um, Appleton, all of which have been sent to collections. Um, and so those are, those are items that also could be taken into consideration. I think that the applicant may be on the line, though, so it would be appropriate to listen to him. We'll make a motion to open the floor. Second. Second. Motion to open the floor made by Alder Stevens, seconded by Alder Lefebvre. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The floor is open. Uh, Mr. Rice, if you're on the call, please just state your name and address for the council. Cordell Rice, 1363 Mesa Drive, apartment 14. All right. Go ahead with your comments, sir. Um, so you guys told me that it was a total of $1,000, I believe. Uh, I can hit this camera too. It was a total of a thousand dollars, and um, I paid the woman on, and I called around to try to see what the exact balance was to see who I had to pay that one to in Brown County, and they sent me to a collection agency, which the collection agency was telling me about some stuff from 2013 that I honestly didn't even know about. So I gave them what was uh, outstanding here for as of right now that I owed you guys, which I think it was a total of eight something. And I paid that today as well. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Alder Stevens, you got a question? Yeah, oh, yeah. a comment. Um, I don't know if Attorney Chavez can answer this. When we were at um, our committee level, we were informed it was approximately around $600. Is that, can you clarify that? It was. I received an updated, um, an updated figure from um, Attorney Mather. So she said when she went further back into um, the court system is where she found um, the records indicating there was additional amounts. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, outstanding amounts that are uh, in collections currently. And then there are- Is that one, for the city of Green Bay or the other municipalities? These are all for Brown County. It's not broken down um, by municipality within the county. So it's entirely possible that the amount that was identified at the meetings pertained to those amounts that were originally identified. Um, so I, I don't have the exact breakdown of, of um, what was prior, um, but I anticipate it's probably. Okay, so if I recall correctly, the conversation I... and protection policy was to have the city fines paid in full, and if he could, to pay off a Schwabenon. That was the recommendation to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if Alder Stoyer needs to correct me, please. No, I, actually, that's correct. Mm -hmm. That I remember. So we that. weren't worried about anything but Brown County. It was $600, and is, uh, we wanted the money that was owed to the city of Green Bay, the $600 to be paid to the city of Green Bay, and we were willing to work with him so he could get his license. That was kind of the, the conversation. Mm -hmm. words, we were willing to help him. You know, we're, That's why we're discussing it tonight. And if he paid that six hundred dollars to the city, that's what we were told at that time. And uh, you know, I'd like to see him, you know, get back to work, and uh, so he can pay up the rest of these fines. If, did he did he pay it, at least the six hundred dollars to the city of Green Bay, ma'am, uh, Attorney Chavez? I don't have the exact amount that was paid. All I know is that um, Officer Mahoney was the person who called over there, Lieutenant Mahoney who called over there to the municipal court to confirm. They were not able to provide him with the amounts that had been paid. Um, and then by the time that I was able to, that this ended on my desk, the, account, the court was closed for the day. So I don't have that information, but I would defer to the applicant. Yeah, paid hey, Mr. Rice, go ahead. They told me it was uh, about 800 and something. And that's what I owe Brown County and I paid it all in full, including the, where the city of Green Bay. And um, I actually paid Ashwamadon also. I got the, uh, the email receipts if y'all want me to see. 
There. Thank you, sir. Uh, Alder Stoyer. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I believe Mr. Rice is making a, a wholehearted effort to do this. I mean, we had a long discussion about this at, at committee, and I think the tenor was that if he paid the, the money to Green Bay, uh, you know, took care of that fine, uh, and then also looked to Ash Schwabenen, but really take care of Green Bay's, that we would be willing to move forward. And I feel like he is doing that. Uh, I know there's a couple of things that he was unaware of that sort of cropped up a little bit. Uh, I think that his heart's in the right spot. I feel that he will he will do good by the city, and I'm confident with that. So I would like to vote one one one. Close the floor. Oh, You're right. I'd like to vote eventually. Okay, that's what I want to do. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, <laughs> I do have a comment either before or after. If it's for the applicant, we can entertain it now, Alder. Otherwise, no, we'll it's, it, no, it's not. So. Okay. Um, motion, motion to close the floor. floor has been Second. Made. Alder Stevens, seconded by Alder Dorf. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The floor is closed. Alder Stevens. I just, I, yeah, I just want to make a comment that this was for, for due to the fact of the expiration of his temporary license, which is happening, mm -hmm. I think, tomorrow or this Friday. So that's why we need to discuss it today. So. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Alder. Alder Dorf. Mm -hmm. I understand that that there's this a time limit, um, and I and I wish we could extend the temporary license. I think this should go back to committee. I don't think that we should be voting on it. I don't think that I think we need a recommendation from committee. I don't think all the alders here have been able. I've actually taken the time to look at everything or listen to protection and policy, and I think we need a recommendation from the committee, or perhaps perhaps you're giving us one tonight. By, by by what you're saying when you're speaking in favor of it. This is not a, a typical case, which is probably why it's in front of city council. Comment. Yeah, Alder, uh, Alder Lefebvre and then I believe Alder Vanderlees. Um, yeah, I, I know this is coming now to the council. Some maybe didn't get to see it all, but like I said, it's time sensitive. If he, if we don't approve this tonight, you know, let's go back to, count, uh, to committee and has come back to council. Uh, he's not going to have a uh, operating license, and how is he going to pay his? If there is some more to be paid, how is he going to pay it? And how is he going to live? He, <laughs> he needs his income, and uh, I think we need to move forward and vote on it and trust the committee. You know, we went through it all. We listened to things. Uh, he has all kinds of, I see, uh, extra people wrote letters in support okay. of him. And I think that we can move forward on this, and I think we should. So I, I would like to make a motion that we accept the payments that have been made in good faith. He, he followed through with what the committee had requested of him, and that we approve this um, um his license. I'll second. second. I'll second that. So there has been a motion to grant the license that was seconded by, or is made by Alder Lefebvre, seconded by Alder Stoyer. Comments on that motion? Motion to approve. <laughs> Alder Vanderlees, I, I believe that uh, good faith has gone forward and, and uh, I'd like to see him get his license so he can continue working. And uh, as, as far as bringing it back to committee, we discussed it at committee, and we were we were pretty. In other words, it was pretty unanimous that uh, we we're going to try to help him get his license because he's losing the temporary permit's going to be gone. And we're going to try to help him get his license, and that was what the reason that we asked him to help pay the fines. In other words, pay towards these fines, and it sounds like he's done it, and he's still got work to do on that. But but he still has to have employment in the meantime. So thank you. Okay, thanks, all. Uh, look at the commander. Mayor. Or work has his and raise and reminder to alders. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to look at the gallery, but you can also press your buttons. Uh, Commander Work. Yes, and speaking with Lieutenant Mahoney, um, he was advised by municipal court that his fines went to collections. Uh, that if he's saying that his fines are paid, obviously there might be some discrepancies there. Um, but if he has the documentation to show that all his fines have been paid and Munich court um, can see that tomorrow, um, that then then that clears up any confusion. But uh, while we were speaking on this, I touched base with Lieutenant Mahoney, and that's what he advised. Okay. 
Okay, thanks, Commander. Um, on that point, Attorney Chavez, would it be appropriate for counsel to make thing of this license contingent on the receipt of that, the confirmation of, of payment in full? So there are a couple of things. Um, I mean, yes, we can make it contingent upon receipt of the, the payment in full, but his, his provision will expire um, potentially before it's ultimately granted. So that, that's the one, that's just for informational for you. Um, the other thing is the fines. Um, so what were discussed last time, um, as I stated, they, the, the numbers are, are different. So there were, I believe, about 2,000 that actually went to collections with regards to Brown County. My understanding, standing, I said, um, like I said, when I spoke with Lieutenant Mahoney earlier, is that he had made payments not in the entire amount. So what we will see, we, we what we don't have from 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 municipal court is the actual amount that was paid. Standing amount still has not been paid. So, um, you know, it's about it's holding on to it until um, full payment. So I believe that two thousand is actually paid. Um, his provisional will likely expire before that happens. Okay. Other questions or comments from council? Alder Gerlach? Um, this is a question I don't know who to direct it to, so I'll direct it to you and you decide who will answer it for me. Um, I, I have twice gone through this agenda um, before the meeting and never could find any of this supporting material until just now when I'm Maybe it's only available in Civic Clerk. I don't understand, but I've just only seen it now. And I don't understand some of these things. There's so many attachments here. There's a May 10th, 2021 arrest and conviction record. Am I supposed to be paying attention to that or is this just about paying a fine? I don't understand. Why is this material here and what am I supposed to do with it in terms of voting? Attorney Mayor. Chuck. Oh. I so I didn't handle the PMP meeting, so I, I only have I can only tell you the basic um, information, which is that so nothing case specific. But you are permitted to consider anything in the criminal history that is an actual conviction. So that means pending arrest, pending charges, none of that can be considered. And then um, the charges have to be related to the license that is being sought so the information is provided to you um if it is determined that it is relevant um i know sometimes some information makes its way to you all like, like i said i'm not really sure what is including i think that may be something that pd would be able to speak to um denial is usually because there are items that have been flagged in the background um by either pd or the law department and then it's coming to council, specifically PMP, and then council, because the person is 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 it's basically explaining their case to you as to why, despite these issues that are in their past, they should still be granted an operator's license. Okay, thanks, Attorney Commander Warwick. Anything to add there? Sorry, he she was uh, Attorney Chavez was cutting in and out. Um, you know, from, from our recommendation, um, we needed to see the, the fines paid in full. Okay, thanks, Commander. Alder Stoyer. Uh, th thank you, Your Honor. Um, like I said, we talked about this at length. We, we looked at the, uh, the felony, we looked at uh, some of the misdemeanors and things like that. And our committee, after a long discussion, really came to the point that it, it just came down to the fact of paying the fine. You know, we, we put that other stuff behind it, behind us. We we felt comfortable, I think, in a decision. Um, if we can split hairs, we could do that further. But I think at the time when we looked at his record, uh, Mr. Rice's record, we came to the conclusion that, you know, we did the right thing in terms of moving forward and, and we just started looking at the fine being paid. Now it sounds like there's a couple little discrepancies with that, but with his license about to expire, uh, sometimes you have to go with your gut on something like this, and I, I'm going with my gut. 
I just feel that we should move forward, and I think that he will do right by us. And that's just my belief. Thanks, Thank Alder. You. Alder, Stephen. So regarding this, I know uh, we asked him to pay off the fine strictly for the city of Green Bay, but it sounds like currently we don't know if he paid it off in full. We're getting told that fines are Brown County. We made a point of we wanted the city of Green Bay's fines paid in full. And from my understanding, I'm hearing that may not be the case. Or the attorney did not have enough time to clarify that the invoices were paid for. Jim, am I correct on that? So I, again, I get this partly because I wasn't at that meeting. So here's the situation is from, from law department's perspective. An amount was identified as being owed to the city at the council meeting. But then as attorney Mather was conducting more research on this, she identified that there were additional amounts that were outstanding and had been sent to collections as well from prior years. Um, so going back further than what our normal review entails. And so those amounts in total are in collection, which is why the amount that was discussed um, at the last meeting is high, uh, is less than the actual amount that's owed. So even if we went and paid, the total amount that was um, discussed at the, the meeting last time, he wouldn't have met the, the all of his amounts that are owed to the city. And do we know that total? The total amount that I have Allen County is $2,018.20. But you don't have the breakdown for the city of Green Bay? I don't. It's just um, broken down by county, and that would include a Schwabenon. All right. Well, unfortunately, I think we need to hold this, bring it back to PNP. We, as a city, didn't follow through what was discussed at PNP. I don't know if we can hold an emergency meeting for protection of policy and this common council grants us final approval. Thanks there so needs much. to be a special discussion, even with, you know, we're in this license because it's going to expire. So. Thanks, Alder. Alder Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. This is a question for Attorney Chavez. Do the state statutes allow us to uh, extend the issuance of a provisional law? License. The statutes are silent. What we do know, I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. The statutes actually state that they expire 60 days after issuance, so they cannot be extended. Um, we, what is not clear, what is silent in the statutes is whether or not a new provisional license could be issued. Um, so my recommendation with action tonight, since there isn't, there isn't anything actually providing that authority, um, granted there's also nothing prohibiting that. So could this body in theory, and I, and I appreciate your recommendation, but could this body make a recommendation that says, we're going to issue a new provisional license and then tack on the contingency that uh, the balance be paid in full, because what that would do then is give us 60 days to verify that the balance has been paid, while at the same time not putting him in a compromised position uh, without a license. Could we in theory take that action tonight? The issuance of provisional licenses is by the clerk. Um, so I think, so this is why I say it's a little, little bit tricky because there's nothing that says the clerk couldn't issue a second provisional license, but there's nothing that says she can. So for to, to, to issue a directive, it's not, there's, there's not anything really there. But what I can tell you is the license would expire. So at this point, if the, the can provisional license is not granted and the applicant is no longer allowed to, uh, in effect, I should say, uh, he's no longer allowed to work, uh, I believe, un unsupervised is, is the... Right. And, and I think that's an important recognize that you just, you, you just accept the bartender and staff and i don't know what the staffing you know situation is where his current employer is but uh clerk jeffries if 
Uh, if, if the applicant came tomorrow and applied for a new provisional license, is that something that you would be willing to issue? Congress and uh, law department and um, Commander Warwick, I would need to, con given the conversation that I've heard tonight, I would really need to confer back with um, the law department and the police department, simply because what I've heard you know, gives me some pause. It, it ends up being a slightly more routine matter for my office, um, usually, and this does not seem like a routine matter. Yeah, and, I, and, and again, I appreciate that. I'm just trying to figure out, right? I mean, a lot of times when things aren't contemplated in the statute, uh, oftentimes it takes someone to do it and then someone to file a lawsuit to challenge whether you're, you're lawful or not. I mean, that's just kind of how the process works. So personally, I'd be okay to roll the dice on that and, and let the state get their language cleared up if that's what it requires. Um, but at the same time, I don't know that I want to put the applicant um, in, in, a, in a position where he may or may not get that provisional while we try to figure out or get confirmation on payment of invoices. So that's why I was asking if that's something that you would be willing to issue. Thanks, Alder. <clears throat> Any additional comments or questions from council? Alder Scannell. Your Honor, I, I got my button pushed. You said to push the button. I pushed my button. Well, I'm, gl I'm, glad, I'm glad you did. Alder I'll Scannell. push your button. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I, I think we could just cut to the chase here. I mean, the committee uh, wanted him to pay fines, and he's made a good effort in paying fines. There's been some complications here about just how much fine should be paid. Maybe he does owe some more. Maybe he got it all paid off. I don't know. But at least he made the good effort to cover what was talked about at committee. It sounds like the majority of the committee is willing to go forward with this. Uh, and so I and given the, the dire straits we're going to put him in if we don't go forward with this, uh, all things considered, I feel uh, comfortable uh, granting him his license now. Uh, I mean, it's going to a collection agency. If, 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 if he does owe more, uh, the collection agency can certainly do their job. And I'm sure eventually, you know, if the consequences will follow from that, you know, natural consequences. I, I'd hate to think we're uh, putting his job at risk uh, over um, maybe it might be a few hundred dollars now that didn't get paid or whatever. So uh, listening to the uh, majority of committee members, it sounds like they're going to uh, support this and uh, I'll go with the, the majority of the committee uh, put this to bed tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Alder Weary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think there's just too much uncertainty. Uh, I watched the meeting, so I, I, you know, I'm fully briefed on that and read everything about it. I, I just think there's too much here that we don't know, especially since you know, there's two pages of, of history here. So this is not just one, we, we're good to go. Um, we are not putting anybody in a bad situation. That already existed. People do that to themselves. So I don't feel bound by that in any way. And I'm gonna make a motion to refer this back to committee. Motion has been made to refer the item back to committee. Is there a oh, second? Sir, that second? Seconded by Alder Galvin discussion on that motion. Alder Galvin. Thank you. I got through a lot of these uh, meetings, both as a police officer and, and now as an alderman. And uh, while my opinion on, on a lot of these applicants has changed in that I think people do deserve a second chance, I think Alder Weary is absolutely correct. We shouldn't feel bad or like it's our responsibility to help these individuals maintain their job. They're the ones that have the responsibility to show that they've changed, that they've gotten a job, but also that they've taken care of the responsibilities that they have from their actions in the past. The fact that this has gone to collection shows that these, these, these uh, fines have been standing out there for quite some time. Um, and, and I just, I, I don't like it when it's like the city council and then we expect the clerk and, and everyone else to bend over backwards to do everything we can. I think we've done quite a bit. I think even the fact, that instead of just saying no, we gave them until this meeting today to try and pay those fines off um, shows that we're, we're doing quite a bit. 
And, and I'd rather see this go back to committee and, and have everything done right. Because once we grant this, we can't take it away. We can't take it back. It's there until it comes up for review in the future. And so uh, uh, we've been bitten a few times by that. And, and I'm willing to, you know, we learn our lessons from that. But I'm, I'm all in favor of sending it back to committee and doing it right. Thank you. Additional comments on that, on that motion? All right, Alder Lefebvre. I, I, I just don't agree. You know, at the committee, we had asked him to make these payments to pay the city. The, his responsibility was to pay the city, and then to look at Ash Wabanon and try to clear those up because we told him if he was stopped for anything or whatever, and they looked up his record and found out that he owed money in Ashwabanon. So he's in Ashwabanon, he could be arrested. So he understood that. And now he said himself that he went, he made his payments, he did pay the city, and it was 800 Instead of the 600 he paid the 800 And yes, he paid today, but he did that was his. That was the condition we put on. We actually put six hundred. He paid eight hundred, and he said he also made some payments to uh, Brown County. I don't know if, if that's Ashwaubenon or whatever, but he did come before us and said, "This is you know I did what you asked of me," and that's why I feel that I'm sorry. Sometimes yes, we have to take a um, a risk, but. Um, do his bartending that's his income I don't know where he's going to get a job because that's what you know he that's his background he told us that's his background with his family his family ran a restaurant and a bar and he knows the business so I don't know where he's a job he'll have to get it soon because he's going to have to pay these off because they did go to collection if there's some more there that he wasn't aware of um, that he still owed on this is, goes way back uh, they're in collection. How is he going to pay them? I don't know. I'm just no. I don't want to go back. I'm sorry. I think we need to take a chance and and go ahead. Uh, I think you know he's tried everything, and we all make mistakes. You know that. We've all made mistakes in our life, and he's trying to change. Several letters from people, the business where he's working. They said they really like him. He does a really good job. There are people that are supporting him. He's changing his life around. And that's what I think what's important. Thank you. Thanks Alder, Alder Dorf. Thank you, I have two things. First of all, I think the committee did a disservice to us all by not making that a motion and then approving a motion that you wanted council to approve. You've left it up to council and now we need, to, even though I was there and I sat through the whole meeting, we all didn't and now we all need to decide. So I would ask the committee in the future, give us your recommendation then in a, a clearer motion, not, not just to hold it. Secondly, just because we would deny this tonight, doesn't mean he could never ever ever get a license again. Um, I, I Couldn't he just simply apply again? Um, come back to if, if we hold this for the next committee meeting maybe he has to take work but it doesn't mean he, he can't work if we would approve him getting a license right now I don't have enough information if we vote on this tonight I'm probably going to abstain um, if we vote to send it back to committee I'll probably vote yes I don't think we have enough information and I really would appreciate it if the committee would come back if it goes back to committee with a really strong motion, what you would want us to do as a council, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Thanks Alder. Alder Stevens and then Alder Burnett. Okay, my second time and I'll be done. So re the reason why this was held for action for this evening was that we needed clarification that those Green Bay citations were paid in full. Unfortunately, we don't have that documentation. That documentation was supposed to be here today for us to say, yes, he paid it. Let's move forward with granting this license. Unfortunately, that did not happen today by either party, by the city nor 
Cord Cordell. So unfortunately, it needs to go back to PNP. So I will be voting to send it back. Thanks, Alder. Alder Brunette, and then and Ice would like to make a comment um, so we can entertain a motion to open the floor. If uh, I'll, make, I'll make that motion, Mayor, open the floor. Second. Motion has been made to open the floor by Alder Brunette, seconded by Alder Dorf. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The floor is open. Mr. Rice, go ahead. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. I was aware of, of the Ashwamanon fine when we talked last week. But I wasn't 100% clear on what I owe for Brown County. That's what we, uh, well, Green Bay, Brown County, I'm not sure what's the, the difference. But um, when you guys looked it up, you told me it was 600. So, and you asked me, could I pay it with the condition if I could try to pay the Ashwamanon also? So, and I've been trying to look it up. Like, like most, I worked most of last week, and today I got like a, a bottom dollar for what I actually still owe right now. And then after I paid that, I called the collection people to see what that was about. I didn't even realize I had those other fines. But when we talked, y'all told me what I had to pay. And it, it, it was real hard for me to scrape up that money real quick, you know? And I, I did it because I gave y'all my word. So I, I understand where everybody coming from, but like I'm literally just trying and I'm giving it everything I got. I mean, that's all. Okay. Thank you for those comments, sir. Entertain a motion to close the floor. Uh, a question, just a question. Uh, so you did pay eight hundred dollars to someone. Correct? Yes, I. And I can send you guys the email with the receipts for that and Ashwamana. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alder. It's Murray. Can you hear me, Mayor Genrich? Uh, Mr. Wickle, for, yeah. for what purpose? Uh, I'm willing to loan him the $800 for me to pay. Okay. We will uh, take that into consideration, sir. Uh, any further questions from council? Can we use the board, Mayor? Uh, motion to close the floor, Mayor. Yep, second. Motion has been made to close the before Elder Johnson, all in favor, signal for saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. Alder Burnett. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm against referring back to the committee. I've heard really good. I mean, you could make an argument in either way, and that's why these votes are often tough. Uh, what I see is a man uh, who took a, a good faith effort to make things right. I see a man looking to support himself and his family through gainful employment. I see a nation, a community that has been damaged due to COVID, many people unable to work, many people not willing to work because they're getting some sort of government you know, benefit. And I see a person who has done a lot to, um, to make things right. Now, ideally, it isn't what it should be entirely. And it is true, we did not create these circumstances um, but these are often judgment calls, and you have many people who are rallying around this individual, and I don't know him. I mean, I mean, I only know him from watching the video and hearing him talk now and looking at the, the documents, and these are tough votes. But by delaying it, sending it back to committee, possibility that he's going to go uh, without a license but even and Alder Johnson, you looked at the provisional aspect, and I respect that. That was a possible compromise to get us out of the situation. But it's not always easy to lose a shift. You know, you lose a shift um, where you collect tips that could set a person even. So, given all of that, and the fact that three, at least three of the committee members here, have stated that they vetted it the best that they could through their positions. And they're saying that that they're in favor of approval for me if it's a judgment call i would opt to side with a person looking to provide for himself and his family through gainful employment and someone who seems to be sincere in his effort to make things right now judge it's hard to come up with eight hundred dollars 
let's not all forget that. So I'm in favor of keeping it here, voting for it one way or the other. I'm against sending it to the committee. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Any final comments? The motion is to refer back to committee Alder Johnson and then Alder Stevens for a third time. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I, I was going to withhold comment, but I, I really think it's important to kind of get this off my chest. I'm against it as well. Um, I think it's pretty apparent that not many of us perhaps have grown up in or, or have experienced maybe situations where we're living paycheck to paycheck and come with that. Um, I'm one of those people. And, and I'll tell you what, sometimes when you're growing up in those situations and you're trying to figure out where your next food bill is going to come from, where your next rent check's going to come from, those are not easy situations. And, and, you know, the good faith effort that was made to pay the bill, that's really at the heart of what this issue committee talked about. It's the bill. It's not all the other stuff. It's the bill. And I think... You know, it's, it's almost a little bit, sometimes we have to take a step back and recognize that we have the luxury of being immersed in local government and we understand it. Most residents in our community do not know the difference between the village of Ashwaubenon, Brown County, the city of Green Bay, and all the other jurisdictions that come with. And I think here's an opportunity for us to exercise a little grace in recognizing that this individual good faith effort he paid somebody we think we pay we're taken care of we've got an offer from an individual here who who has said that even if it didn't happen the way it was supposed to that he will loan the money to make sure it's happened put a contingency on this to say you know contingent upon payment and if the loan needs to occur for mr wickall that'll happen and then we can go on with life but i'm telling you folks what to say that this person you know can it's not saying they can never work, but maybe not work for the next month. That's meaningful. That's impactful. Sit around this room, any one of us right now, what would you do if you didn't get paid for a month over bureaucracy, over a technicality? That is impactful. And, I, and, I, and, and I'm against referral because I think there's an opportunity for us to resolve this tonight. Um, and, I, and I hope that we have the courage to do that. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Alder. Alder Stevens and Alder Dorf. So I, I have a clarification I would like. Mr. Winkle, is he associated? No. I, well, I, this, no. Is, this is kind of an odd thing to be considering, so I, I don't think we should go down that road. I was just kind of curious because if it's a complete stranger willing to offer to give someone else a loan for $800, I think it's very generous for an individual to do, do that. Instead of holding this, I think maybe we should just hash this out, get it approved tonight, and let's move on. Yeah, Alder Dorf. This is, this is what I think. I, I don't think we should refer it back to committee anymore. I think that what happened is that the, the PNP gave Mr. Cord Cordell the impression that if he pay money, it was going to be yes, and it was going to all go through council, and it was going to be fine. Unfortunately, that's not what the motion said. That's not what we got when we came here tonight. But it, I guess I'm seeing that it's really not fair. He did what they asked him to do, and we're kind of not backing up our committee. Um, and and there, there were other reasons. I mean, I, I looked at the record, too, because that's another thing to take into consideration. And, and for me, I was not comfortable with it. I was not. I'm still probably now going to vote yes on this tonight, but I want you to know it's way more than just the fines that were or were not paid. But I, I do not want this to go back to committee. Thank you. Okay, Mayor, was that? Now I'm, I'm having trouble remembering. Was that your motion originally, Alderdorf? Or did no, I, my motion. No, somebody else made the motion to go back to committee, not mine. Okay. Sure. Uh, let's see. I don't know who did. I don't know. Mayor, do you call me? Yep, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, anytime at PNP, you know, I, I kind of resent some of the insinuations that we didn't take this seriously. I look at this, you know, whenever we have these situations, and we've dealt with hundreds of these over the years, we have the police and the law department that usually will say we deny because of this and this 
then it's up to the committee to look to see if if these folks do need warrant a second chance or not you know alder johnson kind of stated exactly how i feel about this and i you know we, we didn't take this lightly so Nobody said uh, i alder dorf are you talking right now let's Sorry. You know, I, I, I don't appreciate that. I really don't. I'm sorry, but you know what? This is important, and I, I don't I don't interrupt other people either. So I'm just saying that I feel that we should move forward with this, and I, I, I'm against referral. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Alder. Alder Dorf? I just need to say, Alder Storyer, I never, if you're thinking it's because of what I said, I never implied that you didn't take it seriously, never. You took it very seriously. We just didn't have a clear motion. So you you guys did a great discussion. You talked for an hour and a half on it. You you looked at it from all the different angles. You did a great job. I, I'm just asking in the future, come come with the motion that says what you told the person. I'm, I was not saying you didn't take it seriously. So I apologize if that's what you thought I was saying. All right, I, I appreciate that. I Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Is Alder Gerlach? Oh, a question, please, for Commander Warwick. I just don't understand what your recommendation is, sir. Commander? Oh, the, I don't have a recommendation. The, the point I was making before is uh, from the PMP committee, it was just about him providing documentation of paying his fines. And, and that, that's, the, that's the confusion here that we have this evening. Uh, he did pay. Um, and what attorney Chavez says going to collections and the amount paid and where that money was paid. So from the police department's perspective, um, <clears throat> we're, we were just taking from what PMP and the fact that the fines needed to be paid uh, prior to this evening's meeting. Thank you. Thanks, I guess it all comes down to just money. I don't understand. Okay. We do have a motion was seconded all in favor of the motion to refer this item back to committee we'll um we'll, sig we'll vote in favor by signifying aye aye opposed nay Yay. Yay. the nays have it and that motion fails move to approve second motion to approve made by uh, well motion to grant the license yeah, yeah. Motion, yeah. To yeah. motion to grant the license that motion was made by alder brunette and seconded by alder stoyer all in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay? nay. Nay. Would you like a board vote? Yes, Better. let's have a board vote. Okay, we will do that. And this is on granting the license to Mr. Rice. I was saying I will be a yes. Alder Burnett. Uh, Alder Stoyer is a yes as well. My, my, it's not, it isn't coming up on the screen. I, I haven't started it yet, so thank you. Oh, right. Well, okay. Okay, thank you. You may vote. I will record Alders Burnett and Stoyer as yes. Okay. And that motion succeeds nine to three. On to granting operator licenses. Approve. Motion to approve made by Alder Vanderlee, seconded by Alder Scannell. Any names here to be held separately or any abstentions? Seeing none, I'm signify by saying aye. 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 Those nay. The ayes have it. That report is adopted. Plan Commission. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve. Made by Alder Scannell. Seconded by Alder Corpus Dax, was it? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, any items here to be handled separately? Hearing none. All in favor of approving that report, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. You guys have it. The report has been approved. Mayor. Uh, yes, Alder Johnson. Uh, I, I, I'm just recognizing Mr. Rice is still on the call, and you know, oh. it, 
acknowledging that maybe not everyone oh, yes. understands the process, perhaps we could let them know what just happened. Yeah, appreciate that. I did not see that. Um, Mr. Rice, to Alder Johnson's point, uh, council has determined um, to grant your license. Okay, I just want to say I appreciate you guys. I won't let you down. And I'll make sure uh, in the near future, I'll make, start making some payments to the collection agency. All right, that sounds great. Thank you so much, Mr. Rice, for being here today. Thank you. Have a good one. On to Finance Committee. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve, made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Corpus Dax. Any items here to be handled separately? Number four. Two. Any others? Two. Two, two and four. Two and four will be handled separately. Hearing none others, all in favor of approving the remainder of that report, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The report has been approved with the exception of items two and four. Your wish is on two. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Corpus Dax. That item was pulled by Alder Weary. Alder, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is something obviously we discuss every year and we've really never had a, a viable altern alternate to the Press Gazette since the News Chronicle was around. <laughs> so it's been, and I was here for those, so those used to be at least some competitive uh, bidding. Uh, and here's a situation where um, I had to do a little bit of digging because it wasn't quite clear I didn't know in documents uh, what it would cost maybe per year. And um, for Mr. Winters, our, our purchasing manager, uh, it sounds roughly um, maybe $36,000 a year. Correct me, you know, Dan Allenbeck or Jack Allenbeck if I'm wrong, but that would be the cost for uh, the Press Gazette contract, roughly. And, that uh, is what okay. Sorry. <laughs> well, that, that is what was paid in 2020. Okay. And, and Calvin said that it should be roughly that again. So I'm just trying to get a, an idea. Um, and he said that uh, going with the press times would be, I think, 20 to 30 percent cheaper. So you're looking at 25,000 to 29,000 in that ballpark. Um, and, and when asking, you know, go with them, you know, there's a you know, number of different reasons. Mm -hmm. They're not daily, obviously. Um, and when I asked if any other municipality um, used it, I was told no. So I dug into it a little bit myself, and I did find out that the villages of Howard, Swamico, Hobart, and Schwabanon all do use the press times. Uh, so do the school districts of De Pere, West De Pere, Schwabanon, and Howard. Um, Green Bay School District does half with the press times and half with the press gazette, depending on what they want to do. Now, I, I asked our legal department if we could do that. We can't. I guess we have to pick a paper. We can't do some over here and some over there, unfortunately. And correct me if I'm wrong on that, Vanessa, but I think that's, I think you got that right. Um, so I, I'd be that's interested. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, there is somebody here from um, the Press Times and I'd like to make a motion to open the floor. Second. Second. Motion has been made to open the floor by Alder Weary, seconded by Alder Scannell. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, Opposed nay, the ayes have it, the floor is open. Please just state your name and address before addressing our council. Sure, name's Mike Hollihan uh, with the Press Times, uh, 4393 Trent Drive in Green Bay. So, okay, well, well thank you for opening it up. And, um, you know, uh, Chris had, uh, had mentioned uh, the News Chronicle, and I have actually been a part of that. Uh, I've been with the company for 31 years, uh, uh, same company that owns the Press Times. Uh, it started in 1953 with Frank Wood. Uh, with the Daily News when the Press Gazette went on strike years ago. Um, but, you know, with with the Press Times, you know, we're locally owned, we're locally family owned. Uh, the Press Gazette, um, the, the times have changed. Years ago, the Press Gazette was a tremendous paper. Um, and then they got bought out by Gannett, and then Gannett got bought out about a year ago by a company called Gatehouse Media, uh, which in order to get that done, they had to get a loan through SoftBank so they're based now, Gannett, the Press Gazette is based out of Tokyo, Japan. Um, and, you know, the money that you spend with us, if we become the official paper, stays in the community. Um, and, you know, Heather, who's at the meeting tonight, nine times out of ten, uh, we are the only media covering the meeting. Uh, the Press Gazette is hardly ever there. Um, and, you know, things like tonight with homelessness, with what was brought up. Now, Heather's going to write about that. That is going to let the people of Green Bay know what you people are doing. And then a lot of times TV stations will pick up what we 
write about at these city council meetings because they're not at the meetings either. And um, we're 100% local news, 100% local sports. When we had the News Chronicle, those were old, different days. We did national news. But realistically now, um, you can get your national news for free anywhere because of this thing right here. Uh, it's really about local news and local high school sports, uh, covering school board meetings, covering city council meetings. Um, the Press Gazette's essentially walked away from uh, heavy local news and yeah. they don't even cover high school sports unless it's a state championship game uh, or once in a while they do a feature story. But these kids need to be covered, so we cover them uh, on a weekly basis. And, um, um, you know, the Press Gazette, you know, I looked at their Sunday paper this last Sunday, I think had two local news stories. The rest of it was all USA Today Network national news. Um, yeah, and, and like Chris had stated earlier, we're going to save money uh, if you go with us. Uh, Cami Rapson and Mark Leland did a story on us, Cami from Channel 2 and uh, Mark Leland from Fox 11. And they both said that they love what we're doing because we're the only ones that are hyper local to Green Bay and Brown County uh, at all the city council school board meetings. Because as a TV station, they have to cover Marinette, Green Bay, Appleton, Nina Menasha, Oshkosh, the Lakeshore. And, you know, Cami and Mark also, you know, I mean, the Press Gazette just isn't at these meetings anymore. Um, and um, let's see, uh, you know, we're, we're about the people of Green Bay. I, I, I'm born, raised here in Green Bay, went to Promontory High School, uh, been with the News Crown, part owner of the company now. When Frank passed away, his son Pat took it over. Um, and and we we consider ourselves a stewardship to this to the city of Green Bay and to the community. And if we weren't covering these local news stories, these local high school sports, nobody would, and it would be a shame. And it, it really would be an honor if if we could be the official newspaper of the city of Green Bay. And anytime you would need to get a hold of us, you can just call. I'll give every one of you my cell phone. I call me on weekends and nights, um, but you're definitely going to be able to get a hold of somebody. But th thank you. That's that's all I got to say. Thank you, sir. Uh, looks like we have a question from Alda Gerlach. Yes, please, uh, sir. Can you tell? Can how can you assure us that you will be able to meet our needs? And I don't know what the needs are, but I understand that the council or the city has to be able to um, put. Um, bulletins or announcements or something in the paper, sometimes at short notice and you're not a daily paper. Can you talk to that a little bit, please? Absolutely, that's a great question. Uh, our company does own, when we sold the News Chronicle, uh, the newspaper business for a number of years, and then we became the Phoenix Rising from the Ashton. And what we started doing is buying paid weekly newspapers throughout the state. So we own a newspaper in Wapaka, the County Post. It's been around since 1852. A paper in Clintonville, a paper in New London, a paper in Tomahawk, Wisconsin. And all those are once a week paid papers. And those areas have figured out a way to say, okay, we can get it in on a once a week uh, newspaper. So I do think with planning um, and, and um, planning and, and, and be done. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Alder Lefebvre? Uh, yes, I get the Press Gazette. I mean, the, I get the Press Gazette, but I also get the uh, Press Times, and I really enjoy the Press Times because, yes, it has all those that are happening around our community, and I'm a, I'm a county supervisor, so I actually need that also for being on the county board to know what's happening in Hobart and uh, Bellevue and, and different things too because some of that stuff comes up at the county but also for the city um, really you know you do uh, cover a lot of things for the city but also you you can also um, go online and isn't that a daily online do I have that right yeah. and, and the pre the uh, physical print uh, copy only comes out on Fridays is that right Correct. We're daily online and then once a week in print, Friday in your mail. But if as well, the Notre Dame girls are playing Bayport girls in soccer tonight, uh, we won't wait for the Friday paper to put that game story. That'll go online tonight or tomorrow morning. And 
paper will have a recap, but then maybe a feature story of the girl that scored three goals. But yes, mm -hmm. that's right. Daily online, weekly in print. Right. So if there's a, a notice that the city needs to put out, then it can go online. And a lot of people do go online, you know, to read their papers. Thank you, Alder. I think there are some statutory obligations about how notices, you know, need okay. to be placed in the paper and it needs to be a physical one for, for certain notices. So I think that's that's part of the complication. But um, Alder Brunette and then Alder Dorf, did you still have? No, I just, I wanted to make the point that you just made. Okay. So okay, Alder Brunette, you. you bet. The questions for staff that I'll ask later, but Mr. Hollihan, Mr. Weary, Alderman Weary mentioned that other municipalities and school districts have chosen the press times to be their publisher of choice for official notices and minutes and things like that. I'm assuming that's what he meant. Uh, were all those competitive bids just like Green Bay's? Did you have to bid on all of those, um, those contracts, I guess you'd say? Yeah, we did have to bid on them, um, but then basically, essentially, the Press Gazette uh, does not, I don't even think they bid on them anymore. And if they do, they're not getting accepted. But Ashwabanen, um, Howard Swamico, well, Howard and then Swamico uh, and Hobart all use us as their official uh, village newspaper. And they've figured out a way to get it in uh, once a week in print. Um, I'm going to ask the question and, and feel completely, it's completely acceptable to me if you don't answer it. And I don't want to be insulting when I ask this. But you, that you've been on this contract through the bid process, is that, will that be, is that just simply to, uh, never mind. I'm not going to ask the question. I just wanted to make sure that, that um, your company, Press Times, which, you know, I, I enjoy reading your, your paper and Mr. Mrs. Ms. Graves does a really good job covering the city, and I'm very appreciative of that. For that, that this was this would be like you bid on this to become the official paper of the city of Green Bay or something that it wasn't purposely to drive out the city or the Press Gazette from this market. But I, I respect your presentation, but you kind of took a few gigs at the Press Gazette, which I'm fine with. You know, but I'm just saying it just seemed like the beginning part of your comments were, well, we're so much better than the Press Gazette for local because of this make sure that it's that, that you want to be the chosen paper of the Green Bay Press of the city competitive dig at the Press Gazette. That that's a fair statement, absolutely. And um I've been doing this for thirty one years and um without taking up too much of your time because it's already getting late. Um, you know, the newspaper industry has changed. When we had the News Chronicle, the Press Gazette was uh, initially locally owned by the Gage family and then Gannett bought it. Um, but I, there's a book called The Chain Gang, One Newspaper Versus the Gannett Empire. And um, and Gannett uh, had 90 daily papers in the United States. The only place they had competition was here in Green Bay with the News Chronicle. And they did not want us around because they, we kept the advertising rates down. We kept the city legal rates down. Um, and um, it's just a changed market now. They, uh, because of being owned by Gannett, um, you know, out again, like I had said earlier, um, we, we are harbinger for a number of their reporters that have gotten let go. Um, we brought them aboard. And um, I just, it's more of a, more of a, Every, it's a sad situation with what, what's happening in our nation with newspapers is they're struggling. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of them, you know, are, are, are downsizing their staff. And with the downsizing of their staff, they're pr producing less local news, uh, less local sports. And I guess I was just stating the fact that Gannett has made the concerted effort not to intentionally cover high school sports. Um, they do have the staff, but they won't even take press releases from the community and, you know, run you know there's a pancake porky breakfast but in my opinion that's what a, a newspaper should be is it should be all about the community all about the people that live in it and you elsewhere but you know I, I I I'm passionate about Green Bay uh, you know lived here all my life and I really am proud of the coverage that we 
give for the Green Bay School Board or the, the City Council here with Green Bay or the, the Village of Hobart or Howard or Swamico and, and especially the I think we can make a big difference in kids' lives uh, when we're writing about them. Um, so it's more about uh, I would love us to be the official city uh, uh, newspaper because we're the ones that are writing about what's going on in our community. Okay, that's fair. Uh, thank you, Mayor. No other questions for Mr. Mulligan. Mayor Ginrich, I'd like to talk. Uh, yes, Mr. Wickel, feel free to state your name and address. Uh, Murray Weichel, uh in Green Bay, 533 East Walnut in Michigan. 3890 Oakland Drive, Bloomfield Hills. Um, so I just want to kind of say this. Um, we sat down with uh, Mayor Schmidt and also you, and we brought 120 jobs to the Green Bay Press Gazette building. I invested $2 million. And I'm just on this because I just want to clear it. SoftBank does not own Gannett. Google Gannett right now each one of you it's a u.s company and green bay press gazette puts millions and millions of dollars back in the community and i personally invested into 533 and helped get the census there and that was 6500 dollars per person now if you want to have a clear uh opportunity let the press gazette come in with uh the press times i'm a subscriber of the press times i like the press times but you can't go and say SoftBank owns gannett that's false that's totally false you can't say they don't cover long time stuff they've been here forever they their public notices group is on the second floor and i'd love every person here to go up there and see all the jobs they've poured in in the last two years 120 jobs what does that mean mm -hmm. What is the Press Times board in? Not that. I also own the Oshkosh Northwestern building. We're putting more money in there. I mean, these are stewards of the community. Now, if it's a better deal for 22,000, take the deal. Don't say SoftBank owns the Gannett. Don't say they're not covering hometown. That's false. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Alder Gerlach. Um, sir, I have a question. Please, first of all, please tell me how to correctly pronounce your last name. Uh, Murray Weichel. My brother is Michael Weichel, the rhyming name. He got at school. Okay, all the time. I'll go with Murray. And I'm also the guy who offered to loan the previous gentleman eight hundred dollars. Yes, yes, I remember that. So, um, um, can you just tell me? Can you? What is your? Excuse my ignorance, but what is your role with the Press Gazette? Uh, my role is I purchased the Press Gazette about four years ago, and I, as the developer, redeveloped it. I brought in the digital group, the public notices group, uh, all that. And it was a strategic call for them to choose Green Bay over Indianapolis, Phoenix, and we invested to bring them in. We put in high-speed internet. And currently, about two months ago, I sold the Press Gazette building to another uh, investor, but we're still the property and project manager Press Gazette. So, did you? Did I hear you say you're the owner of the Press Gazette? I was the owner. I was the owner up to two months ago. Okay. Um, so then, I oh, the building, just the building, not the, the paper. Oh, the building. Okay. So you can't make any promises on behalf of the Press Gazette newspaper. No, I, my recommendation, just to be clear, is to let the Press Gazette have an opportunity with the Press Times to present. And I'll be happy to let them know that Press Times is presenting and let them have that opportunity. Okay, thank you. Off Bank does not own uh, Gannett and the things that this gentleman's saying is not, was pretty much 80% not true. <laughs> because they created 120 jobs in the last two years. And they, they've done a ton of hometown stories. They're also the newspaper of the Green Bay Packers. What's more American than Green Bay Packers? Thanks for your comments, Mr. Weichel. And just, just to be clear, Prescott did have the opportunity to attend our meeting tonight. There wasn't any kind of a, an invitation, you know, made specifically to, to Mr. Hollihan, at least from the, the city administration. Um, so Prescott did have that opportunity. I have no problem here with that. I just have a problem saying that they're open by the, owned by the Japanese SoftBank. 
Yep, no, appreciate that correction. Um, questions or comments from Mr. Weichel? Motion to close the floor. Okay. Motion has been made to close the floor by Alder Dorf, seconded by Alder Scannell. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it, the floor is closed. Alder Brunette, Alder Dorf, Alder Weary. the floor, Mr. Mayor. Oh, go ahead, Alder Weary, and then Thank Alder you. Brunette and Alder Dorf. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think, as, as Mr. Weichel even stated, if it's a better deal, take the deal, and I think that's what we should do. Uh, you know, we're gonna be saving, uh, what is it, anywhere from seven to 11,000. You know, we are the stewards of the taxpayer money, and I think we should look at that and I think there are advantages to having a paper that uh, is, is people read it because they want the local news and it's, it's been growing and growing and I think it makes good business sense. So I, I'm gonna make a motion to uh, award the bid for the official paper of City of Green Bay to the Press Times. Second. Motion has been made by Alder Weary, seconded by Alder Lefebvre to award uh, this contract to the Press Times. And, and just one last comment, Mr. Mayor, regarding that. Uh, if if all these other municipalities and school districts can figure it out, you know, all across the you know the, the cities that were mentioned by Mr. Hallahan and then the ones I mentioned, I'm pretty sure we can do it. You know, they're not smarter than us. So I'm pretty sure we can do it. Thanks. Thanks, Alder. Alder Burnett, and then thank you. Um, I'm in support of the motion. Uh, at the moment, uh, depending on how the conversation goes and the questions asked of staff, I might reconsider. But uh, I'll be honest, uh, it's a little strange. Um, I commend Alder Weary. This is great to have, uh, have Mr. Hollihan here. But in all my years on the city council, I don't recall a situation where, you know, we, we bid out a, we put out a bid. I don't know if that's the right word, a proposal two companies bid, our staff picks one for whatever reason and, and, and for good reasons because of the readership and the daily newspaper or the Press Gazette and that we've been using them for a very long time. Those are all very good reasons to go with Janet. But here's a situation where if you're going simply off of cost, the Press Times is a lower cost and it seems to be an emerging publication. So, so as such that other municipalities and school districts have picked them and have you been using them? And as far as I'm concerned, I haven't heard any negativity in regards to press times. The reason why this is a little strange and I'll be completely honest in saying that is we basically have a company that our city staff did not get has the choice basically come here and to do a sales pitch. And I, I don't recall that ever happening in any other situation where a company that lost a bid or was chosen, not chosen by staff, come and basically provide a reason why they should be the chosen person. Now, everything all else was equal, I'd be like, we'll go again it. But here's lower cost to the city and the taxpayer. And I don't see any issue with going with the press times. I just want to make it known that I, I think it was odd. And I don't mean any disrespect to Mr. Hollihan, but but the presenter, you know, spoke negatively about the bidder and or the other company. And don't get me wrong, I'll go with the underdog, uh, David versus Goliath. I'm, I, I, I like the independent press and I like competition in the marketplace. I'm all about that, but I wanna make sure that we make this decision for a valid mm -hmm. reason. And for me, that valid reason is cost. To go with the press times, it's a lower cost to the taxpayer. And that's why I'm supportive of the motion. It's not about anything with Gannett or any of the big, you know, big guy versus little guy. I wanna make that known when I make this vote. It's simply about cost. So thank you. Thanks Alder, Alder Dorf. Okay, so as chair of finance, we did look at this. Now, I, I, this is certainly a very nice paper. Um, it, if it's about cost, we're not going to be saving any money because when we have to have it by state ordinance or state statute in print, then we have to go and pay the Press Gazette. Like when we amend an agenda and we got to get it in print the next day, you know, we have till five o'clock 
for, for the Press Gazette the night before, and we amend agendas all the time. I mean, that all the time. So maybe we didn't do a good enough job at the Finance Committee. Um, maybe we need to... I, 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 is there a statutory reason we have to decide this tonight? Because we meet next Tuesday and then council meets the Tuesday after. Maybe we need more information because the reason that my understanding, Green Bay Public Schools did this. They, I don't know if they still are, but then they had to pay a whole bunch of money to put those notices in so that they were in print because it's more than just the bid. Also, that these bids are set by state. There's a there's a maximum bid, and and perhaps I could ask um, Director Ellen Becker if she has a, a deeper understanding of, of how that works. The statute, do you, or or maybe not? I don't have a deeper understanding of the statute. I would re refer to our attorney. I do seek um, Calvin Winters, our procurement manager, on the line, and he can probably answer at least the timeline of uh, the bid. If there is a need to have to, if there's time to send it back to committee or and then um, approve it at the next council meeting, Mr. Winters, on on that point, uh, there would not be time to send it back. The existing contract does expire on May 31st, as it does every year. Um, so I think your timeline of meeting at your next meeting is actually going to put us in a position where we will not have an official paper named, which would be against the statute. And so to continue you can't just look at the bid now maybe we want to split the money between the press gazette and we, the press times what i'm not well, saying sure. that officially i'm not saying calvin that of, officially we have to have one paper but then we are going to have to pay the other paper because they are in print i don't believe though by posting i think attorney chavez can back me up i don't believe by posting in the non-official city paper we are meeting the statutory requirements oh that's right we did talk about that in finance because we brought up that in finance and then we're not meeting the statutory requirements by not posting in the non-official paper i don't know what to do the press times is great but it it's not a daily paper if I can make one point clear here, uh, the decision was not made solely based on the fact that it was a daily paper versus a weekly paper. Um, the Press Times did take exception to one of the bid items, um, which was the publication deadline, which we said uh, by noon on Wednesday for publication on Friday. They took right. exception to that and did say 10 a.m. on Wednesday rather than noon. So there well, the reason that we moved on to the next bidder was because they did take an exception to something in the bid. That they could not fulfill something in the bid. Correct. Okay. There's there's, there's more to the story. I, it's not it's not just about the fun. That's just what I wanted to say as as chair of finance. It was it's a bigger story than just the bid. Thank you. Thanks, Alder Alder Gerlach, and then Alder Lefebvre, and then it looks like Mr. Hollihan would maybe like the floor opened again. I want to thank Alder Weary for bringing this uh, forward as a possibility. And I do love the press times. And I want to thank Mr. Hollihan for representing it so well. I just think, I know we keep talking about money tonight and I know we always have to talk about money, but I think it comes down to something else. And I, it might be Clerk Jeffries who can answer it. It comes down to flexibility and the ability to publish quickly and often more than once a week. I really think that's it. Um, who on the staff, uh, or, or Mayor Genrick, maybe you can answer this. Who can tell us the what is the bottom line that we have to be able to, um, to address when we choose our newspaper? Yeah, I would definitely defer to Clerk Jeffries, uh, Mr. Winters, and Director Ellen Becker on, on those questions. Could we get Thank those you. answers, please? Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Alder. Um, so in terms of our ability to get notices out, there are several types of notices. Uh, notices we have to publish once, we need 15 days. No, notices we have to publish twice um, with certain days in between. Perhaps those are notices that would be well suited to a weekly paper. However, and can everyone hear me? Are you hearing me okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay. However, there, there are a few notices that um, really give me pause. <clears throat> and this has to do with elections. 
Uh, so we have to uh, publish a five-day notice for special voting deputies, and these are people who go to nursing homes. Um, while we are very thankful for our caregivers in our community, as you can imagine, these are people who are extremely busy balancing the needs of their residents as well as the needs of the families. And oftentimes when, um, and as I have discovered these past, uh, this past election cycle, in order to make this five-day notice, which is a state requirement, I need to work very, very closely with the um, staff, the care centers, the nursing homes, and oftentimes they they get me the information just before I need to publish. Um, and that that time for special voting deputies is is um, just before election day, a few weeks before election day. So it's a very tight timeline. Um, five days is not like many notices that we have. Uh, so that's the one notice that really gives me pause. Uh, and that is an absolute requirement of the statute by the state, by the WEC and the, the state. Um, I know that there were things in the bid that welcomed uh, weekly publications as well as daily. Given the number of notices that my office, as well as other offices, the development department, especially DPW, we, we need we need that that flexibility and that frequency in order to meet our statutory deadlines. That's what I would say. May I follow up on that, please? Yeah, go ahead, Alder. Uh, please, God, let's not mess with our elections anymore. If that is what is needed, let's listen to our clerk. Um, I I so much appreciate the press times and Mr. Hollihan, and I hope that. Perhaps we can revisit this next time. It's time to renew the contract, but we must listen to our clerk and we must have a, a, an agreement with the newspaper that will let us meet the statutes and requirements and, and do it right. So I, I have to support staying with the, the uh, Press Gazette this time. Thanks, Alder. Additional comments? Alder Weary. Alder Weary. and then Alder Weary. Can I go ahead, Mayor? Alder Vanderlees, go ahead. Uh, it's hard to do business with, with the paper that we're just getting once a week. I, I think that's a problem. And, and, you know, like you got your loose leaf pickups and all the different notices that we have. People really follow, in other words, either follow it online or they file it in, follow it in written form. And, and it sounds like the, the statute is in other words so close that we really can't change it for this year so i think we're just going to have to move forward with the press gazette for this year and uh i think that's just the way the cards are drawn right now so i'll support what you know as far as keeping the press gazette for this year uh that's my thought thank you thanks alder alder weary just to a few previous comments um i have seen where bidders have come to council it's not common but it has happened um, so i just wanted to point that out and i, I didn't invite mr hollahan i wanted to point that out he actually asked how he could attend so I, I did not invite anybody to it i was just doing some research on my own um i, I would like to open the floor in a minute but uh, i would ask um you know, how long is a schwabenen and howard have them have had them as their official paper because if there were issues with posting notices about elections, I'm sure they would have pulled up roots and went right back to the Press Gazette. So I think that might be more of an issue of us just getting, to, you know, learning how to get on that timeline. Because obviously everybody, else, you know, all those other places have mastered it. So if they were having issues with it, I, I didn't hear any issues with their uh, noticing of elections or anything like that. So I, I don't, I don't think that's an issue. Um, but I would make a motion to open the floor. Second. Motion is made to open the floor by Elder Weary, seconded by Elder Lefebvre. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The floor is open. Mr. Hollihan. Well, I, I appreciate everybody's comments. And, um, uh, you know, that would be my thing is Ashwabanen has done it for years uh, as uh, the, the paper being the official newspaper. Uh, Howard, Paul over in Howard, same thing. Uh, Swamico actually just started a couple of years ago. Um, so so they have been doing it. Um, I don't know if there's time to reach out to them and find out what they've been doing and how they've been doing it. Um, but 
I guess um, I'll leave it up to you guys to vote it. Um, you know, our whole thing is, you know, hyper local news, uh, covering city council, school board, and, 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 and reporting uh, Green Bay news to people in Green Bay, and that won't change. Thank you for that. I, I do have a question based on something that Mr. Winters had said, Mr. Hallahan. He had noted that that you had sort of objected to the Wednesday timeline at, at 10 a.m. Was curious if you could just comment on that. Well, that, that's our uh, normal deadline. If that was a deal breaker, I'm sure we could extend it to noon. Okay, good. Uh, if I can point out, uh, we can't let bidders alter their um, submitted bids after everything's been open and put out in the open. That would be very unfair and very unethical bidding practices. Thank you, Mr. Winters. For Mr. Hallahan. Motion to close the floor. floor. Second. And to close the floor, made by Alderdorf, seconded by Alder Scannell. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The floor is closed. Alder Scannell and then Alder Brunette. Uh, yeah, I, I think we're getting into the weeds that we usually get into with budget time. When we're comparing the third largest city in the state to villages. I mean, uh, our needs are not the same. And to compare us to uh, a village and the operations of a village and, and how they, uh, their needs, you're comparing not even apples to oranges. It's, it's, it's apples to uh, uh, corn, not even in the same family there. Uh, I, I think, you know, I, I love the press times. I got a, I got a subscription. Uh, 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 and I, I, I like the idea of going with them, but it just feels like it would be a big challenge for us to fit into a weekly format, unfortunately. Uh, we're just too big. Our needs are too great. We need that flexibility. And uh, I, I just don't see how I can uh, make the responsible call to go with them as much as I would like to. Uh, I think we have to look at our needs, which are considerable staff is far more aware of them than, than, than we are. And I think they've chosen the Press Gazette because of that. Uh, obviously, I think if it, it, coming in with a lower bid, I think they would have gone with them if they thought uh, uh, the, our needs could have been met there. Uh, so unfortunately, um, not. And, and I think I, I'm going to be supporting staying with the Press Gazette. Uh, maybe uh, we can look at uh, the future of how we might be able to rearrange things or something, but for doing something like that now, I, I just don't think it's practical. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. I believe Clerk Jeffries has something to note. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. I also wanted to note that, you know, as I had mentioned, we have several types of notices, some that go out once, some that go out twice. Liquor license notices go up three times. So, you know, once again, the frequency is uh, important to the clerk's office and to the proper functioning and noticing of some a core function of this office in the city, and that is the issuing and granting of liquor licenses. Thanks. If, if I could ask Clerk Jeffries. Yes. Uh, thank you. The um, other municipalities, the Shravan and Howard, they have clerk offices as well, right? With the same they requirements. They do. Okay. However, those other places don't have as many care facilities as we do, nor do they have as many liquor licenses. But they still do it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Clerk Jeffries. Uh, Alder Brunette. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, Alder Weary, I just want to say, um, Mayor, Alder Weary, if I had a, had a perception that you invited Mr. <laughs> if that was what you, I apologize. I didn't mean to make that comment. I just assumed that's what happened. Um, and, and, and thank you to Mr. Winters for clarifying the bid process. That was my concern. This thing, this whole thing, just to me, um, just the process. I wanted to make sure that the bids were competitive and that we were fair to Gannett and also to the press times. And oftentimes it's up to staff to kind of clear us in the straight and narrow to make sure we're following process and that we're not creating a unfair system when companies bid. I do... Uh, uh, going with the press times um, and because they did provide a bid and it was competitive and in my estimation it was better than the Gannett bid that's just my opinion uh, based off the criteria and the agenda packet and what I noticed in the meeting um, 
there's a there's a danger in society when there's a lack of competition. So you have a, and again, it's not simply because of the David versus Goliath thing. I want to make that very clear. That's not shaping my decision in the entirety. But when we have a lack of competition for government services and contracts, it creates a bit of a monopoly. And I like to see an emerging uh, provider uh, be able to prove themselves. And they did it with a good competitive bid. Um, so it's not like we're just ignoring all the other things to go with a smaller entity. There, there's a very intriguing uh, case that Mr. Hollihan made. I am a little uncomfortable entirely, if I'm honest, because we didn't have a similar sales pitch from Gannett. Now, the mayor said that they obviously could have come here and could have presented. They could have addressed the council for whatever reason they chose not to. But I'm, I'm comfortable going with press times for a one-year trial. Or, uh, Mr. Winters, is it a one-year? This is every year we we, bid, we go to, we do this, right? Yes, yeah, so this is an annual contract. Yeah, other municipalities on it. Granted, they're not as large as Green Bay, um, but there's no harm in trying one year, in my opinion. I'm going to go with press time for this year. Thanks, Alder. Uh, Alder Dorf and then Alder Lefebvre. Well, I, I too like the Press Times and I too subscribe to the Press Times. And I just will not be able to vote for them because I want to make sure that we are not breaking state law and that we are able to post and to do what the things that we need to do according to state statute. So I cannot go with the press times this year. Maybe next year, give an opportunity to look into how Howard does it, which is a, a village and Brown County runs those elections and whatever. Maybe next year it could be a different story, but to, to do this this year with the knowledge I have, I feel that we would be putting our city in jeopardy by doing it. And it doesn't mean it can't be done in the future. It just means the, this discussion should have taken place at committee. This person should have come to committee. We should have known about this so that we could have checked on these things. And now here we are down to the wire. So I cannot vote for the press times. I'm very sorry, because I do really think it's a great paper. Thanks, Alder. Alder Lefebvre. Yeah, listening to um, Clerk Jeffries, um, I think I'm going to have to say no I, I can't go with the press times right now i do really like their paper i think they do a better service to our community and i'm sorry if mr wickle said no the the uh, press gazette has failed us as a local paper um i'm very disappointed in the uh, press gazette the only reason i get it is for the t i'm sorry for the tv listings I don't, I don't want to go on the, on the TV and have to write down, oh, this night I'm going to watch this and that. Sorry, that's what, Ed for the funnies. <laughs> There's so many things in the Press Gazette that are two days late. I already heard it on the TV. So, but I, I, I love the Press Times. And I'm hoping that that they can expand. And I'm thinking that they will, and maybe they will be, uh, maybe they can, you know, twice a week publish a paper, the physical paper, because that's what I like having the physical paper. I, I don't go on online because I'm on this on this darn computer too much. Stuff. I don't like reading stuff on, on it, I'm sorry. I like the physical paper, but I think, I'm sorry, I don't think I can vote for it for this year. I just, uh, I would like to, but I think I don't wanna jeopardize us. There might be some things where <clears throat> if we can't uh, publish them like we should, even if it happens once, then we might be in trouble with the state. So I, I'm sorry, I, I just can't at this time. Thanks, Alder. Um, and, you know, I was led to believe this was going to be a short meeting. So uh, we are three hours in, folks. Um, Alder Stoyer. You are muted. I'm sorry. Um, I'll, I'll try to make it brief. I, you know, a lot of this kind of came up 
you know, when we had this ordinance issue about the littering and we talked to the Press Gazette, and they assured we'd do some things. That's off the topic a little bit, but there was some time sensitivity with that. And uh, so we looked at that carefully and the Gazette seemed to come forward and say, we will do better. A good point too about the bidding process, they both went to bid and you can't change it after the fact. So I, you know, it was one item, but it wouldn't be uh, kosher to do that. So I, I agree with that as well. Uh, I'm hoping the press times will get bigger that way as well. And the fact is that we're, we're four times bigger than any other community around us. Um, I keep thinking that something will slip through the cracks if we don't stay with the Press Gazette. Um, I'm thinking next year, hopefully maybe we can change that thought. But right now I feel that, you know, we need to stay with stat state statutes and I think we need to stay true to that. So I will vote of uh, the Press Gazette. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. So we do have a, a motion and a second to award the contract to the press times. If there isn't any further debate, we uh, can have a vote there. I'll do it on the board. Yep, we will use the board. And again, this is to award the contract to the press times. Thank you, Alders. You may vote. Clerk Jeffries Burnett is a yes. I voted wrong. Clerk Jeffries. Uh, yes, thank you. I thought uh, I was voting for Press Gazette instead of Press Times. Okay, so you would like to re record it as a no. Thank you. Okay. And we need one other person. Uh, Ms. Alder Stoyer, can you please vote or tell me how you'd like to be recorded? I will vote no. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> And that motion fails 10 to two. So we do have the underlying motion, which uh, has been moved and seconded. All in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. No. Yeah. The ayes have it. That item is approved. On to item four, which um, I'll entertain. Oh, we don't need a motion there. Just a discussion item. So uh, Alder Dorf, you pulled that item? Right. And it's just that I would really like to urge every member of city council to please attend the next uh, finance meeting on the 25th. We're going to be talking about or learning about how we can use the money from that we're being awarded that large amount of money from the state, from the federal pool of money. And we're also talking about the, the CIP. It's important because we're not going to be able to have a, a meeting this year like we've had in the past couple years where we've had the joint finance committee meeting about the budget we we did do that with bonding too the last two years we don't have time to do that now because we're a little bit too late so the only way you're really going to be learn learning about the bonding is if you can please try to attend or watch those meetings better to attend because you can ask questions and so the 25th is an important date and the other the next important date is june 22nd which is the final finance committee before we vote on bonding on uh, that will be at council on the 29th is that pretty much correct director ellen becker that's what i yes, have written I down yes i can confirm yes we would have discussion on may 25th um and then by june 22nd we uh, because on the finance side, we do need that time to complete many different tasks in between, but then the finance on June 22nd would make a recommendation to council on how much they would want to bond. June 29th would be the initial resolution at the Common Council. We need three weeks at least in between before your next um, council meeting. And then on August 3rd would be the final award resolution for the bonding. So we don't have a meeting in, in July, so it's going to skip from, so by the 29th, we really, of June, we need to know what we're going to do. And then we can just imploring you, please come, please learn about what's going on. It's a huge document, 700 pages. Thank you. I'd like to join in what Alder Dorcha said, yes. Um, the final recommendation that comes out, the recommendation that comes out of finance the closer it can be to what we actually approve at council makes um, our lives a lot better because we already have all the financial numbers, all the initial resolutions, all the information put together. 
Um, we can always change them after a council meeting on June 29th. It's just easier if we have um, the more finalized number on June 22nd. Very good. Thanks for those comments. Could they send out emails, Mayor, on uh, all that information? Uh, that'd be great if they would to each council person. Yeah, yes, Director no. Allen Becker is nodding her head. So looks yeah, like thank you very much. Here. You bet. All right, that's just discussion. So we'll move along to a report of the personnel committee. Motion to approve. Second. Approved made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Dorf. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The report of the personnel committee for May 11, 2021 has been approved. Receiving place on file. Motion to receive in place on file. Second. Motion to receive in place on file made by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Dorf. All in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have Mr. it. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I was going to quick make one comment. I did open up the file and I'll, I'm sorry, the map <laughs> that shows very smallly shows my area. Every other every other street really shows up. I think fix the map so that it shows us, my street out here, that we live here. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, but maybe somebody does. So <laughs> there has been a, a motion uh, made to receive in place and file the building report for April 2021 um, and the municipal court report for April 2021. On to resolutions. Mo uh, motion to suspend the rules. Second. Motion has been made to suspend the rules and take up uh, all four of these re resolutions with one roll call vote. That was made by Alder Scannell and seconded by Alder Dorf. All in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it and motion the rules to adopt. Ended. Second. Motion to adopt by Alder Dorf. Any discussion? We will use the board. Alders, you may vote. Um, Jeffrey Destroyer is a yes. Thank you. Alder Stephen and Burnett. Uh, it's not showing again, but yes. Burnett, okay. yes as well. Okay, thank you. I'm um, sorry, my screen. Yep, those have been approved 12 0. On to petitions and communications. Going once, going twice. Seeing Mayor, I have a question, Mayor. I have a question. Go ahead. Is it one, uh, I do have one that I'd like to make, but uh, I'm just thinking, when is the deadline that I need to have that in by, you know, for the uh, ensuing meetings? The Maybe deadline, thank you, Alder. The deadline is uh, by Thursday afternoon. Okay. All right. Thank you. Great. On to adjournment. Motion to adjourn. Here. Motion to adjourn yeah. by Alder Scannell, seconded by Alder Vanderlee. All in favor? First. Aye. 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 Nay. The ayes have it. We're adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank good you. Night. Good night. Have a good Peter week. Zane. Peter mm. Zane. <laughs>